Welcome to the Bakersfield City Council meeting. This television broadcast is brought to you by the local cable companies, the County of Kern and the City of Bakersfield. You can watch the rebroadcast of this meeting Saturday at 7 p.m., Sunday at 10 a.m., and the following Wednesday at 7 p.m. You can download the agenda for this meeting at www.bakersfieldcity.us. Presiding over this evening's meeting, the Honorable Mayor Karen K. Go. Good evening. It's my pleasure to call to order the 515 City Council meeting of September 23rd, 2020. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mayor Go. Here. Vice Mayor Parlier. Here. Council Member Rivera. Here. Council Member Gonzalez. Here. Council Member Weir. Council Member Weir. I'm here. <laughs> Council Member Smith. I'm here. Council Member Freeman. Here. And Council Member Sullivan. Here. Thank you. On March 4th, Governor Newsom declared a state of emergency in California due to COVID. The governor also passed several executive orders, including the suspension of some components of the Brown Act related to meetings such as this. And Council Member Weir is participating by phone tonight. All council votes will be conducted by roll call. And at this time, I'd like to invite Carlos Baldovinos, who is the executive director of the mission at Kern County. The mission has done so much. In the prior meeting, we talked about the expansion over there, and it has been a pleasure to work together. Thank you, Carlos, so much for, transform, for working together to transform lives. And after Mr. Baldovinos leads us in the invocation, we then have the pleasure of having his son, Sam Baldovinos, who will lead us in the pledge. And Sam is a senior at Bakersfield Christian High School. He is my alternate appointee currently on the Youth Council, the Youth Commission, and he's also an athlete, varsity, water polo, swim, and basketball. Basketball, just like his superstar dad. A debate team, presidential award honoree, and California Scholarship Federation member, and then also an Eagle Scout. So we'll have uh, Mr. Baldovinos followed by Sam. Would you all please stand? And we're so pleased to have Amy Baldovinos, the mom who made it all happen. Mayor Go, thank you for the opportunity. Council, good to be here with you again. Uh, you guys do great work. Thank you for all you do for our community. Um, you, do, you do so much. So I appreciate you and, and just uh, the support through the years you've given to Mission at Kern County. So could we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for this day. Thank you for our city council. Thank you for our mayor. Lord God, thank you for all that they do for in this community, Lord God, and to lead our, our, our beautiful city. Thank you for their efforts, Lord God, and I just uh, thank you again that you put your hedge of protection around them. I pray that you give them that your guidance, give them your peace, give them your instruction, Heavenly Father. And again, thank you for our time together. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Thank you, Valdivino's family. Here are a few guidelines to help our meeting run smoothly. We request you turn off your phones. Please be courteous in the use of cameras and videos. And for safety reasons and as a courtesy to others, no signs are allowed in the council chamber or in the lobby. Applause is allowed during the presentations portion of the meeting, but not allowed during other portions of the meeting. Please avoid any behavior that disrupts the meeting. Madam Clerk, would you please read the first item? Under presentations, proclamation to Jennifer Henry, Executive Director of Links for Life, declaring Paint the Town Pink Month in Bakersfield during October 2020. It's my pleasure to welcome Jennifer and Mertza. You're going to introduce her in just a minute. And we are just so pleased to celebrate with Links for Life in their dedicated service to this community. 
what challenges we face as nonprofits during this time, and it's just so wonderful to see your, your tenacity. And so today, it is my honor, uh, joined with Jennifer Henry, Executive Director of Links for Life, and Maritza Jimenez, President of Links for Life Board of Directors, to declare the following. The mayor of the city of Bakersfield, California, has officially proclaimed October 2020 as Paint the Town Pink Month in our city in recognition of an estimated 276,000 women in the United States who will be diagnosed with invasive breast cancer. In recognition of the more than 42,000 women who will not survive this diagnosis. In recognition of the unwavering support of family and friends offering sanctuary and encouragement to loved ones in the midst of their treatment. In recognition of Links for Life and other organizations who are so committed to increasing awareness and finding a cure for breast cancer. And in recognition of the effort to unite our community through awareness and personal experiences, not only during the month of October, but throughout the year. Thank you so much, Links for Life, and it's my honor to be able to present this proclamation, and I invite you to make comments. Good evening. I'm so excited to be in public and in person. So thank you for having us here today. We want to thank you for supporting us the past 27 years in Kern County. We stay here. We're 100% local. All the dollars stay here to take care of our women and families. In this year, we'll have an approximately 400 women diagnosed with breast cancer, and we'll lose approximately 100 of them. And we need your help to continue to support links because there are no government funds that come to us. And uh, we do apply for grants, and boy, we've been working on PPP in the county and the city and everything under the sun to make our funds come in. But it's Kern County, it's Bakersfield, and most of our constituents are in Bakersfield to fund us. And we continue to fundraise. So on October 3rd, wherever you are in this world, you can join us in a walk. And it's called Lacing It Up for Li Links for Life. It's our 14th year. And Register on our online. We have medals, we have prizes, we may have masks for survivors. But join us, walk, film where you are, hashtag yourself linksforlife.org, hashtag LIU20, and then post it so that we can gather everybody because it takes a whole community to take care of each other. And we appreciate the board and the mayor and everybody in Kern County and Bakersfield that support us. And, um, Maritza, our president, has been a huge supporter with Kern Family Health Care, so we just want to thank you and all you do. Thank you so much, Maritza. Yeah. Would you like to say a few words? Hello, everyone. i um, glad to be here this evening, and we do appreciate um, our certificate received today. As Jennifer mentioned, it is um, an honor to be part of this community, be able to serve and help our women. Uh, women are the staple of a home, so we want to make sure we're taking care of them, of mom. So when you go home, let your know, mom know that we are taking care of them here in Kern County. So thank you for the certificate, and thank you for allowing us to continue to support our women here in Kern County. Thank you so much. Let's take a photo together. Come back. Madam Clerk, next item, please. Presentations B, Certificate of Recognition presented to Kenny Reed, owner of Guthrie's Alley Cat, for 80 years of service to Bakersfield. 80 years, what do we say about 80 years, Kenny? This is an icon, and so it is my honor today. Let's celebrate 80 years in beautiful downtown Bakersfield. Council Member Gonzalez should be very, very happy. So it's my honor today to be able to present the Certificate of Recognition to Guthrie's 
Alley Cat in recognition of your iconic landmarks, 80 years of dedicated service to the residents of Bakersfield, in recognition of over four generations of cultural history offered to our community, and in recognition of your continued commitment to provide a neighborly venue for connection and relaxation. Congratulations on this outstanding milestone, and today it's dated the 23rd day of September, and I am so honored to be able to present this to you, Mr. Kenny Reed. Thank you very much. Contrary to popular uh, belief, I've only owned, owned that place for 45 years, <laughs> not the entire 80 years. Uh, also, uh, with me is Patricia Fike, who is the third generation owner of Guthrie's Alley Cat. And she will be taking it over uh, any day now. I've actually, she's been running it. If I don't know what I'd do without her, I'd have probably left years ago. But uh, she has taken up, she's picked up the ball and ran with it. And uh, she's doing an absolutely great job, I tell you that. So thank you very much, you guys. I do appreciate it. Congratulations. Councilmember Sullivan, you are the one who really wanted to celebrate this. So while we're taking a photo, would you like to offer a few comments? Oh, thank you. Yes, I heard Robert Price give one of his reports about Guthrie's Alley Cat. And of course, that is very familiar and dear to my daughter's heart. They've spent a certain uh, celebrated different uh, activities there and different occasions there. So always, Kenny's been around for a long time and we appreciate his, his efforts and his dedication to Bakersfield and downtown. Of course, uh, Andre appreciates him as well. So thanks for coming, Kenny. <laughs> and another 80, another 45, <laughs> of, at, at least. Thank you, Council Member Sullivan, Council Member Gonzalez. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanna say congratulations, Kenny. It's good to see you in person and uh, it is for certainly, I get the opportunity uh, to visit so many people who visit downtown Bakersfield from all around the world. And uh, the Alley Cat certainly is a landmark. And um, thank you for all the work that you do. And uh, I may be the downtown councilman, but Kenny Reed is Mr. Downtown. So. <laughs> true, true. Thank you, Karen, nice job. I'll also add that my now fiance and I actually had our first date at the Alley Cat. So I guess I owe you a lot for that. Thank you. I wish I had a dollar for every time I was told. Oh, boy. <laughs> well, congratulations, Alley Cat. Madam Clerk, next item, please. Public statements. Public statements, due to the governor's executive order which waived the Brown Act provisions requiring the physical presence of the public in light of the pandemic, public comments have been encouraged to be made by email and phone call to the city clerk. Those received in such manner have already been provided to the council. If you're here to make a public statement, please fill out the public speaker card and give that to the city clerk. All statements are given a three minute time limit, 15 minutes per topic. If you have written comments that are longer than your verbal statement, please give those to the clerk who will provide copies and to the council. If you're here to speak on a workshop matter, we ask that you speak after staff's presentation on that matter. And if you're here to speak on hearing the hearing item listed here today, now isn't the time to speak. You'll be given an opportunity when the hearing item is called. We're very interested and concerned with your issues. Due to the public notice requirement of the Brown Act, the council can't take action when an item isn't on the agenda. The council can, however, refer your matter to committee or request that staff contact you. Again, please avoid any behavior that disrupts the meeting, such as repetitive statements or going over the three minute time limit. So Madam Clerk, do we have a, just a few public speakers here today? Let's see, kind of a thick stack. How many do we have? And go ahead and just um, give me the overview. 
speakers not speaking on a workshop item, we have two public speakers. Speakers on public items, we have 30. The first of two is Mr. James Zervis. Welcome, please introduce yourself. Thank you, Madam Mayor and members of the City Council. My name is James Zervis. I'm the Chief Operations Officer with the County of Kern. And I am here uh, speaking to you on item number X on your consent agenda. That is the memorandum of understanding between the city and the county related to uh, business, small business support and nonprofit support programs for COVID-19. Um, I am here to, to let you know that the Board of Supervisors uh, approved this same MOU last Tuesday on the 15th. Um, and that was, uh, so that's, that's been approved and I'm here to uh, really offer the county's support and answer any questions that the council may have uh, regarding that item that the, the county can offer. I will add that it's really my pleasure and our pleasure to be able to work with the city in this manner to really effectively and efficiently deliver these programs that are needed by the local businesses and nonprofits uh, in, in Kern County and specifically in the city of Bakersfield in this case. So uh, it's been our pleasure to work with your staff on this matter and I'm here uh, if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zervis. What a pleasure it is to be able to collaborate. The city, the county working together for the benefit of our citizens. We really appreciate that. Council members, anything? All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Next public speaker, please. We have Curtis Bingham. Welcome, please introduce yourself. Oh, yes, Curtis James Bingham, senior, servant of our Lord and Savior, God Almighty, Jesus Christ, who truly is only begotten Son of a Holy Heavenly Father, God Almighty. And I'd just like to thank you guys for having a God we trust because that's how everything worked. I'm here for a special purpose today. And the Lord had me to be here because he wanted to bless all of you guys up there in the council. Any time that you have ever been disrespected or somebody says something negative to you or just did something that wasn't right to you, the Lord just would like to apologize. The Lord has the way he do things just as we do. And the Lord wants you guys to remember those times maybe somebody just honored you. Because all of you deserve honor, and the Lord told us all to do that. Nobody should ever come up here with any type of disrespect whatsoever. So the Lord would just like to apologize. And for you, Mayor, thank you for going through the battles you've been going through, doing what you're doing, being our mayor. Pamela Harris running for vice president. You honestly could fit that role right today and you wouldn't have a problem doing it because you was born with a gift from my father in heaven. That's why you're able to do what you're doing as mayor. There's no school for mayor. And so pray God continue to bless you. Something else the Lord wants you guys to remember. Please remember this. Remember resist and food stamp. You know, law enforcement, without them, we would have no city council uh, because you couldn't operate, you know. And the Lord wants you to remember, any time cases come to you, because you got some going to be coming, remember, resist. Did they resist? The Lord tell us, do not resist. When they tell us something, we're supposed to do it. So if they tell you to do something, you resist the wrong way, or you move another way, or you move your car, or you talk back, you're talking smart, you are resisting in violation of the Lord. And the Lord said you can receive condemnation. So when these cases come, take a good look and see, are they resisting? And you're going to see a lot of resistance in there that people ain't seeing, see. And the Lord wants you to remember in the word food stamp, when people look at law enforcement, that's what they see. A lot of them see food stamp. I can get me some quick, big money real fast if I can go ahead and get myself involved in the case with them. So the Lord just wants you guys, because they're going to bring it to you. And last time he brought it to you, they were threatening your job and everything because they had a heat of passion when something happened that wasn't even us, but they ready to get down you guys' throat, see? So the Lord wants you to remember all the work you do all year long and how what law enforcement do all year long. If heat of passion come again, just remember that word resist. It's in Romans chapter 13. The Lord put it there because the word resist is to get the person home safe and get the officer home faith, 
safe. So you tell your family, your friends, do not resist whenever they got to pull you over. Respect and honor them. And you'll probably find yourself going home with no problem. But you guys are going to have to be dealing with issues. So I pray God be with you. Thank you. And the Lord just wanted to bless you today. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Bingham. Madam Clerk, next item, please. Under workshops, we have... Workshop A, Presentation of Citywide Solar Program. Mr. Clegg. Madam Mayor and members of the City Council, you've received a blue memo that indicates that this item will be pulled from this agenda so that we can do further staff analysis. Thank you. Next item, please. And to clarify, an additional memorandum has been provided to the Council transmitting correspondence regarding item uh, A on presentation for citywide program. And additionally, under workshops, we have the first reading of the following ordinances, adding a section and amending various sections to the Bakersfield Municipal Code. Thank you, Madam City Attorney. Thank you, Mayor, Council, Virginia Gennaro, City Attorney. Tonight, I'm going to be giving you a PowerPoint presentation on the topic of hens. And if I could get the light, thank you very much, Lena. So as background, the city council on August the 12th a couple of months ago, directed the city attorney's office and staff to come back with what I'll call a very basic ordinance that allows hens in all zones. And that vote, you may recall, was a 4-2 vote with council members Weir and council members Freeman in opposition and uh, the vice mayor uh, absent at that particular meeting. The council at the time also referred the matter to go to the legislative and litigation committee and that was held on September the 2nd with council members Gonzalez, Sullivan and uh, the vice mayor as chair. The purpose of going to that legislative and litigation committee was not to again um, reopen the debate as to whether or not HEN should be allowed but rather it was again simply to review the draft ordinance that the staff had put together get some feedback uh, from the public as well as the committee and in particular really have a discussion on the number of hens that should be allowed when we came back to council tonight and the setback requirement. So tonight I am going to review uh, for you the ordinance options for first reading and as you know from the mayor we will then receive public comments when I am, uh, when I am finished. We begin really with a, with a simple uh, a, a simple slide which is the definition of a hen and, and frankly I, I admit that uh, this is something that escaped me back in, in 2012 when we went through this but the hen is the female version of a chicken and the rooster is the male, uh, male version of the chicken and why is that important? Well it's important because in the municipal code we have a section under fowl uh, 6.08 and as you can see in that second paragraph um, fowl includes chicken and that is up until again if, if you decide to go down this route that is where uh, chickens are only allowed in the residential suburban as well as the agricultural section of the code so we wanted to keep everything the same there uh, however we wanted to take out um, hens and so that's why the definition of hen was critical so what we have proposed tonight is um, the line outs as you see under 6.08 as well as the additional definitions and when we define fowl we are going to specifically exempt or accept a hen. We will then define hen uh, meaning of course the female chicken and we will define rooster as the male chicken. From there, uh, staff added a chapter to our municipal code and we thought it would be appropriate to put it under 6.09. We again begin with basic definitions, uh, the same for fowl, hen. Uh, we added a definition of coop as well as enclosures and hen house, they all mean the same. We added a rear yard definition um, and again kept the rooster definition. 
The next section, uh, the 6.9020, is really somewhat of the meat of that section. Uh, that then allows what the council directed um, in August. Uh, HENS would then be permitted in R1, RS, RH, and um, AG. The next section, of course, of course deals with then um, the purpose of having a hen, which would be for egg lane and or pet companionship. And then the next section deals with the number of hens allowed, um, which was 12. Now, the Legislative and Litigation Committee did have some discussion on this. There was not a vote taken, but I think I can speak that there was general consensus that 12 appeared to be a reasonable number. It was, it was the number that was um, suggested by the hen advocacy group, and it is consistent with the Kern County Code. The next section, uh, 050, talks about enclosures and how each uh, enclosure must be kept clean, uh, dry, odor-free, must provide adequate ventilation and water, uh, adequate exposure to sun and shade. And then, um, again, we really want to get to item F as in Frank. That's that last one. We're, we're going to go into a little specificity here, but that every enclosure must be located at least 30 feet away from any off-site residential building. Now again, we want to look at that because back in 2012 and even when this ordinance was originally drafted, I had put in um, 30 feet away from any residential building. Well, what's the difference? Well, if it's 30 feet away from any off-site residential building, think in your mind you have a house, you can literally go right outside your patio, you can have that coop abut your, your, your patio, and as long as that coop is 30 feet away from the next neighbor, you're okay. Um, back in 2012 and originally, we had any residential building, which would mean the coop had to be 30 feet away from your own house, as well as 30 feet away from your neighbor's house. So the 30 feet away from any off-site residential building um, would allow for more opportunity in, neighbor, in neighborhoods to have coops. Again, um, we did chat about this at the Legislative and Litigation Committee. Um, we indicated to the committee that it was consistent with what the county code has. We felt that it was easier to understand and enforce, so you did not have code enforcement officers out in various neighborhoods with uh, tape measures and, 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 and different, different types of uh, mechanisms. Um, and we also felt that it would not l eliminate all small lots. What do I mean by that? Uh, we're going to see some schematics in just a minute, but my understanding in talking with staff is that the smallest lots here in the city have approximately a 50-foot square wide lot. And so again, depending on where that lot is located, if it's at the end of a block or perhaps a cul-de-sac, even the smallest lots in the city of Bakersfield, with the 30 feet away from any off-site residential building, uh, would still have an opportunity uh, to have hens if that's what they wanted. So tonight, if you do move forward with first reading on option number one, option number one is the 30 feet away from any off-site residential building. The second option that was brought up at the Legislative and Litigation Committee was this tiered approach on setback. It was something that um, was actually brought up that afternoon by one of the HEN advocacy uh, speakers. And if you decided to go down this route, uh, this was four hens for a 10-foot setback, six hens for a 15-foot setback, and eight hens for a 20-foot setback. Again, that was from an off-site residential building, not from any residential building, but rather from an off-site residential building. Again, uh, to reiterate, I, I would tell you that from staff's approach, um, Staff does not favor option two, simply because, again, it seems to be inconsistent with what the majority of council had asked for back on August 12th, which was a basic ordinance. This seems to be somewhat harder to enforce, a little bit harder to understand, and I think more importantly, it is not consistent with, with the county code. Uh, from there, the next section deals with odor and noise impacts, and we want to be sure that uh, the odor of having hens and that the noise of having hens um, is not perceptible uh, beyond the boundaries, which would cause discomfort or disturb persons, and so this would be the section that that would be contained. 
Another section, of course, for feed and water to make sure that there is access to feed um, as, well as, clean, as well as clean water. And then again, that the owner shall not allow any hen to roam outside of an enclosed rear yard. Again, coming back to why we needed that definition of a rear yard. We have a section on prohibited acts. Uh, I think really the focus here is uh, to make sure that hen breeding for resale, hen fertilization production, and hen egg production for resale is prohibited. Uh, finally, we have a penalty section, which is uh, in all of our chapters, and uh, we went ahead and made this across the, across the board. Someone can get cited as, as either an infraction, a misdemeanor, or an administrative penalty. A couple of schematics for you that Development Services uh, Director Mr. Boyle put together for the committee as well as uh, the council and the public here tonight. This basically shows lots that are on, give or take, 6,000 square feet. If you look closely, some of them are a little bit bigger. Um, but the, the black indicates the house or the building. The green indicates the buffer zone. And the white areas would be where one could have a coop. So if you're in the audience and you're looking, it would seem to me you'd really want to look at that white. And as you can see, there's, there's plenty of white on a 6,000 square foot home for an opportunity uh, to have hens. When you go to the next schematic uh, and you look at an 8,000 square foot lot, again, you see much more white. I can't imagine it being a problem. And the last schematic is the uh, 10,000 square foot lots, and you can see um, how much white is visible on that particular screen. So again, um, should a majority of you decide uh, to pursue this route and allow hens in all residential zones of the city, there are some other code sections that need to be modified. Again, why? Because when we changed that definition of fowl and we took hen out of that definition, we had to go back through the code and we had to look for every place else in the code that we use the word fowl or we use the word poultry and we had to insert um, hen. So we would need to do a first reading of our noise ordinance which would basically add to the list, add hens to the list of animals that cannot make noise that unreasonably disturbs the peace and comfort of any neighborhood. We talked about how the definition of fowl would be changed. Uh, 6.20 would add hens again to the list of animals that cannot be injured during theatrical performances within the city. Uh, 15.68 would also need to be amended um, again to add hens to the list of animals that may not be kept in mobile home parks within the city. And then of course all of the zoning ordinances that you see there uh, would need to be amended in order to allow or uh, provide permissive use in order to have hens in the R1, the RS, the RH, and the A. Uh, the M3 would be uh, permissible to slaughter hens in that particular zone. So tonight, this is the last slide. Um, you really have a couple of options as I see it. Uh, one, you can do nothing um, or you can give staff further direction. Um, or you can have first reading to amend um, or first reading of section 6.09, which is the new code section. Uh, option one, which is as we, I think, discussed, or you can have first reading of um, 6.09 with option two. That was the tiered approach on the, on the setback requirement. Regardless of which one, though, should you decide to have first reading on, uh, we need to have first reading also on the cleanup ordinances, which would be 6.04, 6.08, 6.20, 15.68, and then 17.10.12.19.31 and .32. And so with that, I am available to, for questions, as I'm sure um, Mr. Clegg's staff is as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Madam Clerk, how many public speakers do we have? I know some cards came in later. We have 33 public speaker cards regarding this subject. Karen, I have a quick question. Go ahead, Councilmember yeah. Sullivan. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, when you mentioned mobile home, yes. that wasn't an eliminating factor because it still pertains to the, uh, the lot size. Is that correct? Uh, Councilmember Sullivan, I'm not sure I heard you correctly, but hens would not be allowed in mobile homes the way this is currently listed. 
Okay, it seems like because there are mobile homes on own your own lot, it seems like it would still be focusing on the size of the lot. Well, there is a separate section, uh, Council Member Sullivan, uh, in your packet uh, that talks about 15.68.070. That's already on the books, and it does not allow fowl or dogs or cats to run free in mobile home areas. So again, if we get that far and you don't want to have first reading of 15.38, we, we can deal with that. Well, of course, we're not, we're not talking about fowl running or hens running free. We're still talking about backyard. Councilmember so Sullivan, um, this will be an opportunity first to hear from the public and then we'll come back and you, okay. you'll have an opportunity to comment during that time. So let's go to public comments right now. Now, typically, we allow 15 minutes per topic. I, I see there is a lot of interest here. This issue impacts our entire community. So I am going to extend the time. Just kind of keep in mind, though, that we have 33 speakers. So I will ask you to make your statement. And if somebody's already made that point very clearly, um, you might just want to echo it instead of saying it all over again. I know some of you have already spoken before our council three to four times. And so if, in the interest of time, if you can uh, make sure that your statements are very concise, we're going to be hearing for the first time from some of you, but some of you have already spoken before us many, many times. So let's uh, be respectful of one another. We're interested. This is an important topic, but uh, let's try to move it along as quickly as possible. So the way we'll do it is, I'm going to ask the city clerk to call two speakers. One will come up here, and the other will just stand by that officer back there, ready to come up quickly. And then we'll, we'll keep doing that. So there's always one person ready to, to come up. So Madam Clerk, would you please call the first two public speakers? Rhonda Newport and Gary Simmons. So Ms. Newport, if you come up here, and Mr. Simmons, just stand back there, ready to come up as soon as Ms. Newport finishes. Maximum would be three minutes per speaker. Good evening, Honorable Mayor Go and council members. My name is Rhonda Newport, and I'm the president of the Bakersfield Association of Realtors. I'm here this evening representing over 2,300 realtor members. We oppose the drafted ordinance regarding item 6B on tonight's council agenda, and I will make my comments brief. While the association's mission is to protect private property rights, we also support public policy that builds and maintains healthy and vibrant communities. We do, believe, we do not believe that the items before you have had adequate public discussion and thorough evaluation of the impacts on residential properties. If these ordinances were to apply to lots of 6,000 square foot more or more, that encompasses essentially all R1 properties in the city. We are ardent supporters of the land use and zoning process and believe this zoning issue and believe this is a zoning issue and should be vetted through the same zoning process. The domino consequences and unintended cumulative implications of such sweeping ordinances are far reaching and we do not believe all possibilities have been fully and properly vetted. There needs to be more clear lot size restrictions clear setbacks, and clear limitations to protect the integrity and safety of our neighborhoods. There must be adequate considerations given to substantial evidence presented, legal implications given there has been no EIR process, disclosure issues related to zoning, as well as noise, sanitation, and enforcement issues. Lastly, if this item is to be considered at a later date, our association would like to offer additional assistance through our access, funding, and resources, such as the National Land Use Initiative, to help provide support and comprehensive analysis in order to make the best public policy in regards to this issue. On behalf of the association, leadership, and members, we thank you for the consideration of our feedback on this matter. We urge your council, utilize the ordinances already in place that have been through a thorough public process and reconsider this matter at a time when further evaluation and a public process has properly taken place and consider the issues outlined above. Please do not make a rushed decision on this issue. 
that has the potential to impact so many. Thank you for your leadership and consideration. Thank you, Ms. Newquist. And now, Mr. Simmons, and then would you call the next one also after that, please? Barbara Louie. Mr. Simmons. Good evening. Once again, the uh, Board of Realtors uh, stated uh, very eloquently and very, uh, very professionally what uh, the recommendations are from that organization. So I won't repeat that. Uh, the uh, underlying issue here is COVID-19. And so many issues have been put aside and delayed because of COVID-19. That is an extreme, extreme concern for our community. COVID-19 will win when you and your immune system is compromised by chicken disease, whether it be Newcastle or any additional disease. Your immune system will be compromised and COVID will win. There'll be another fatality that we can read in the paper every day. So we have to think about our entire community, not somebody that has a personal need and a personal opinion that a chicken in the backyard is going to improve their lifestyle. The number one risk factor, if we did all of our homework, and we did, and we've provided the mayor, the city manager, the city attorney, Mr. Boyle, and all of you, a very well-documented report from the University of California at Davis. This has done research in dozens and dozens of cities, done research regarding the ordinances, and our ordinances are totally inadequate. They're unable to vote on. There are so many very important things that are left out for the security. One or two examples. How do you dispose of a chicken that has a disease? How do you dispose of a chicken that died? There's no ordinance for it. We've called animal control. They don't pick them up. There's nowhere to drop off a dead chicken or a sick chicken. You haven't considered any of that. The feral chicken population will grow when somebody has a sick chicken and they drop it off in the city park or somebody else's neighborhood at night because there's no disposal. So we have a lot to think about. I want to address the new task force that's being put together to provide assistance to the Latino population. They have a high degree, a high percentage of COVID incidents, much greater than other people. We need a collaboration between that council and that task force to let them know and give them the information that we've received. So we can go on and on and we get into emotions because people fall in love with a chicken and they want it in their backyard, but we have the security of people that have invested money in 85,000 R1 residences. I'm gonna take this last moment because I was asked to read this from Raleigh Moore. And some of you are old enough to remember Raleigh Moore, a city councilman here. He wanted me to read it. To whom it may concern, my wife Dorothy Dottie Moore has pulmonary fibrosis, terminal incurable disease. Any lung infection would be disastrous. We live in the bulb of a cul-de-sac with the backyard fronting four other homes. Should this ordinance pass, Conceivable, we could be surrounded by 48 chickens. This is at a time when we're fighting a major life-threatening virus in our community and our home. He wanted me to read that. But he also wanted me to say, retired Lieutenant Commander, United States Navy aviator, Vietnam veteran. So I accomplished that for him. So we need to think there's a tremendous amount of education in this room. There's a tremendous amount of professional experience, we need to slow this pace down, and we need to do more research on what's best for the community, not a very small group of people. Thank, thank you, I know I went over time, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Simmons, thank you, Mr. Moore, for your service, and Madam Clerk, please call the next two. So we have Barbara Louie and Joseph Candle. <laughs> Welcome, please introduce yourself. My name is Barbara Louie, I'm a retired teacher with Bakesville City Schools. Mayor Go and council members. I first heard about this hen ordinance in the Bakesville Californian in August. My first reaction was panic. 
What are you doing to my quality of life and my home's property value? In 2003, I moved from the lights, traffic, and noise of my southwest neighborhood to a quiet R1 neighborhood across from Thorner School in northeast Bakersfield. The air is fresh and breezy. There's a beautiful view of the mountains to the east and a dark starry night sky above. I love my home. I invested my entire life savings in my home. Yes, I knew R1 zoning allowed for some unwelcome possibilities, but I made my choice with knowledge of those possibilities. Hens in my neighbor's backyards was not one of them. So what could I do? I emailed my council member, Ken Weir, on August 17th. Brianna Carrier in the city manager's office responded, my message would be included in the meeting record of the Legislation Litigation Committee on September 8th. On September 9th, I read in the paper the ordinance was already drafted and going to council for approval on September 23rd. Apparently, the proponents group has had the council's ear for a few months and even helped to draft the proposed ordinance. It's not democracy when one group of constituents has the inside knowledge and access to council while the potential opposition is kept in the dark. Democracy dies in darkness, as the saying goes. Intentionally or not, the council has pushed this proposed ordinance to a quick conclusion, bypassing input from a legitimately concerned constituency. The governor's waiver of the strict provisions of the Brown Act rightfully gives the council permission to carry on urgent city business during the COVID-19 pandemic. But I don't believe adding a hen ordinance at this time is either urgent or wise. Has each of you surveyed or polled your wards? Why not? Are you just taking the word of the proponents group that most of our neighbors are in favor? How would they know? Have you had or sought substantial input from all sides of this issue? It seems not. Seek us out, hear our concerns. When pandemic restrictions are eased, meet with us to show us with facts and research how either our concerns are unfounded or how legitimate concerns will be addressed. Don't bypass your constituents. Please stop the ordinance or delay it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Louie. Madam Clerk, next two speakers, please. We have Joseph Candle and Amar. Mr. Simmons, uh, uh, Mayor Go and Council Members, my name is Joseph Candle. Uh, Mr. Kendall, would you pull the microphone a little closer? Thank you. Okay. Um, you want me to start over? No. Okay. Uh, I'm going to repeat a little bit that Mr. Simmons just did, but uh, I'm going to take my three minutes. Uh, the effort to satisfy council, uh, S Councilman Member Smith's uh, directive to provide this council with an easy-to-follow ordinance with, f a f with few restrictions on August 12th workshop has resulted in what is, in my opinion, a, a hen ordinance totally lacking in numerous, numerous areas. The absence of detail in this ordinance will result in a nightmare to, to administer to the city of Bakersfield. To me, the submitted ordinance is nothing more than a potential material for a possible TV series entitled Chickens Gone Wild. In the prior workshop, the council dismissed code enforcement issues as unimportant. Another glaring admission, as Mr. Simmons said, is animal control. How can these ordinance modifications be considered without taking into account the animal con control concerns? Animal control will be responsible for taking in and picking up hens that no longer produce eggs or are just not wanted, diseased or uh, dead hens, hens loose in the neighborhood bef before becoming feral and causing accidents, prohibited roosters. Also, what's, what's the cost of this going to be? How many hundreds of thousands are we going to spend admi administering this? Now that the overall community is becoming more aware of raising chickens, being allowed in the backyards of R1 zone citywide, there are many public public health and quality issues now surfacing. These ordinance modifications as submitted here tonight 
are totally, in my opinion, unrealistic to real life, everyday conditions. And the situations are providing a real quality of life to the majority of the citizens of Bakersfield. And in my opinion, these modifications need to be rejected and stopped dead in their tracks right here, right now. And the existing ordinance, as is, as is left in place more than ever in this worldwide pandemic times, and hopefully for at least the next 102 years. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kendall. Next two speakers, please. We have Amir and Donald Mixell. Welcome, please introduce yourself. My name is Amir Abbas. I'm a real estate investor. And I thought I'd just, when I heard about this, to come and give my two uh, view points and you know, see if people can just hear what I have to say. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, leadership, for hearing my voice. Um, basically, I focus in real um, single family homes. And um, just an example, I bought this property um, a month ago, and we're rehabbing it right now. And um, I see a lot of pigeons in my backyard and they're, they have their nests and stuff and then I see them over the neighborhoods, uh, the neighbor's house and I'm just peeking through it and I see a bunch of chicken coops, um, hens in there and they're basically hovering over it, um, eating the sea, the, the whatever you feed the chickens and then they're going off and there's bird poop everywhere. Um, also I was just Googling and seeing that uh, if rodents, rats issue, uh, it says rodents will eat chicken feeds, drink their water and shelter in their housing below. Rats will eat eggs, chicks, and kill chickens, even full-grown ones. Rat, so well, they tend to defecate and urinate wherever they are, and that contaminates every surface they touch. There is, this is a real issue. Um, also, when you, if you have rental properties, not everybody wants to live in a house uh, right next to where people have chickens and all the noise in the backyard. So something to consider and it does affect real, real estate values and investing in homes with this kind of activity going on next door. Thank you so much. For your time. Thank you. And would you spell your last name? Sure. Please? A B B A S. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Next two speakers, please. We have Donald McSell and Russell Simple. <laughs> Welcome. Please introduce Hello. yourself. Uh, my name is Donald McCall. Um, I am actually against the chicken ordinance, um, not necessarily due to having chickens in your backyard, but the timing of it. Uh, with COVID, we have just too many vulnerable people out there right now. I mean, everyone in this, except for a few people here, are following the rules and wearing masks. Um, we wear these masks to keep us from a disease. The last thing we want is another opportunity to keep our, our city shut down our cities are crumbling financially right now and the last thing we need is just one more thing added on top one more potential case that is directed towards COVID death um, we'll never get out of this we'll never survive financially unless we open this uh, another thing to th talk about was the graph to where the chicken coops can go based on the graph that the city just presented most of these chicken coops are put towards the back of the home in the wide areas well that puts that closer to my home I just sold my house literally probably two months ago because there was a chicken coop in my backyard. We had a gazebo literally 10 feet from their coop. I had enough of it. I was tired of the ammonia smell in the middle of the day. Once it heated up, the ammonia heated up. You couldn't enjoy your backyard. I literally had to sell my home. Thank God I didn't have to disclose that. But once this passes, I will because it's a nuisance because it was a nuisance. Um, if I don't disclose it and I leave, next thing you know, I'm being sued for not disclosing a nuisance. So it depreciates my home value in my cell because not everyone loves the smell of ammonia. I sure don't. Um, and you know, if anything, if, I'm gonna, if my neighbor is gonna have chickens, why not have them put it up against their home? Let them smell that crap. It's theirs, it's not ours. It's not my problem. I don't eat those eggs. I don't need those eggs. I go buy them at the store for half the cost it costs to produce the eggs. It's how it's $6 to $10 for homegrown fresh eggs. It's $3, $4 in the store. Why not get those? Those are also monitored regularly for diseases, bacteria, salmonella. Residential chickens are not. They're trusting that their chickens are clean. How do they get dirty? They go eat their own stuff. They throw out their seeds, they go peck around, they poop and they eat it up. Next thing you know, they have salmonella and they're eating their eggs and they wonder why they get sick. It's just, this thing goes on and on. 
Um, and then what happens when you go to the feed store and you buy yourself your first 12 chickens and you don't know anything about them? You get home and you have three roosters. What do you do with those three babies after your kids fall in love with them? You chop their heads off. You kill them. That's what you have to do. If not, you give them to somebody else. Who do you give them to? Do you give them to the guy who's on Facebook trying to buy dogs for dog fighting? Who's going to use these roosters for that? Who's going to control it? Who's going to put the money up to stop this? This could be an ever-growing problem like it is in Fair Oaks, California. You can't even go to the parks there because there's so many overrun roosters because people can't have them, so they dump them off. Anyone can Google that. There's tons of them. They can't even park in streets because they have to wait for the chickens to move or roosters to move. It's just this thing is not thought out um, fully, um, and it can be. It just needs to be taking the time to walk through each one of these potential problems that other cities are definitely having. This is not a surprise. It's people aren't responsible anymore. They're just not. Here's a great, another great example. How many people you see in grocery stores that refuse to wear masks because they don't care? They don't care about you. You think your neighbor's going to care about your chickens? They're not. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. McCall. Next two speakers, please. We have Russell Simple and Jane Seller. Well, Welcome. I'm here to present a very positive view of having backyard hens. You've heard a lot of drama, a lot of mystery about, oh my goodness, we're having a COVID crisis and let's add to it. Well, let me tell you folks, our thousands of kids are at home and they're taking care of their dogs and their cats and their pets are something that are bringing them some joy in this COVID crisis. Well, let me tell you, I've been an educator for the last 30 years and um, I'm very proud to be here and thank you for allowing me to tell you that hens, not roosters, hens are very adorable and they do provide very good pets and companionship to the kids. I've talked to dozens of students in the past 10 years that have hens in their backyards currently. They love them. They take care of them. It's responsibility. And in, a, in this time of crisis, of COVID drama, we really need to do something positive for our families. Families are responsible with their pets. We feed our feral cats. My gosh, what do we do with the rats? They're running the fences. You know, don't, let's don't worry about things we can't control. Let's control things that we can, like taking care of backyard hens. Thank you. <laughs> so I, I just wanted, I know I've got a minute and a half. I'm going to be short. I've said everything I need to say. I'm an educator. I support kids. I advocate for families. And I urge you to not listen to all the fears and the drama. We've got a lot of that in our country, coast to coast. While I was sitting here, I was texting my friends in Texas in Atlanta, in Idaho, and they're all saying, go Coach Russ. That's what the kids call me at school. They said, yes, we have hens all over the place, across the country, but not in Bakersfield. So let's, let's be honest with ourselves. These are pets. These are for families. We're going to take care of our pets. We take care of our kids. We take care of our pets. So please consider a vote yes for backyard hens. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Semple. In the lobby, in the lobby, uh, we're just going to ask you to cooperate. Uh, we just don't have applause during this portion of the meeting. I know that you are very passionate, but uh, in the interest of uh, just our decorum, I'd ask you not to applause. Uh, okay. I'm Jane Cuellar, and I simply want to say that I'm strongly in support of the backyard um, hen ordinance passing, and I did send an email with more information um, addressed to my council member, Freeman. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Coyar. Next two speakers, please. We have Michelle Harp and Leanna Harp. Welcome. Please introduce yourself. Ah, I'm gonna ask off. Hi, Madam Mayor and Council Members. My name is Michelle Harp. I had a conversation with a few of my neighbors and friends the other day on the topic of the possibility of irresponsible hen owner not following the ordinance. It was a great discussion and one that we came to an agreement on. 
I would like to share a summary of the relevant points. With every activity, there will be a few irresponsible people. We can say this of anything and everything. If an irresponsible driver causes a crash, do we prohibit all people from driving? If an irresponsible drinker abuses alcohol, do we pro prohibit all adults from drinking? If an irresponsible dog owner does not live up to re responsibility of pet's ownership, do we pro prohibit all people from owning dogs? Of course we don't. Okay, in the United States, people have the right and the expectation should be to be treated fairly and respectfully by the government that it elects to represent them. Denying responsible citizens access to something based on the possibility of some irresponsible citizens' actions would not be fair or respectful. Lawful and responsible citizens should not be punished for the possibility of someone else's irresponsible actions. Our government builds trust, access, and participation from citizens when it makes decisions that respect the responsible majority. The majority of pet owners, inclu including backyard hens, love their animals and want to keep them safe while having meaningful interactions and relationships with them. The ordinance, ordinance is positive because it provides clear expectations, assurance, and guidelines that can be communicated and followed. If needed, the same ordinance may be used to correct the situation of an irresponsible hen owner. Just like every other situation where an ir irresponsible person does not live up to the expectations of a Bakersfield City Ordinance Code, there is an agency that addresses this. Thank you for respecting the many residents, uh, responsible residents of Bakersfield with your yes vote on backyard chickens. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Harp. Next two speakers, please. Leanna Harp and Bruce Bagwell. Hello, my name is Leanna Harp and I'm a recent graduate from Cal State Bakersfield. I graduated from their psychology program and one of the things I found most interesting was child psychology. And I think right now, um, children need our support the most and I think chickens would be a great way for them to learn and have hand-on experience that they would otherwise probably get in the classroom or on a school field trip, but with COVID, they can't have that right now. So I am in support of backyard chickens. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Harp, and congratulations on your graduation. You. Next two speakers, please. Bruce Bagwell and Karen Keller. Welcome, please introduce yourself. You might Hi. want to raise the mic a bit. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bruce, and I've spoken to you guys before, Bruce Bagwell. And I just want to say I appreciate your taking the time um, to hear us all out at the many meetings that we've been here. Um, I'm just going to speak real quickly on something that I think is important. We are part of a community, I am part of a community of, uh, on Facebook that has 522 members We've had a 17% increase in the last 28 days. These are people that are excited about chickens. They're um, supportive of having chickens in the city and will continue to be a support for chicken owners to uh, deal with any problems, questions that come up and support each other so that we are dealing with issues as they come up. And hopefully, I mean, there's always issues. Runaway dogs happen. We don't eliminate dogs. So we work with each other, encourage each other, and teach each other. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bregwell. Next two speakers, please. We have Karen Keller and Joe Newton. Okay, there you go. Um, I'm Karen Welcome. Keller, and I support backyard hens. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Keller. Next two speakers, please. Joe Newton and Callie Beckwith. Welcome. Thank you, Council and Mayor, Honorable Mayor. My name is Joe Newton, and uh, I wear three hats, actually. I'm a property owner for the last 50 years in uh, Bakersfield, also retired from Bakersfield College, one of my students sits up there, and you can guess which one. 
And thirdly, I work with the uh, Realtor Association, Board of Realtors as you know it to be. Um, what caught my attention, I've been the Ombudsman for the Board of Realtors for the last 11 years. Ombudsman, as you know, is the one who is the complaint department, shall we say. I, what caught my attention to this matter was what the uh, City Council of Clovis announced, uh, at least through the Fresno Bee. Uh, I don't know if you've read what the Council in Clovis has done. I'll just read to you, and this will get the gist of my point to you tonight. Residents must wait for the decision to allow chickens. The council delays the vote. The reason they give is the stress on the staff, the police, the animal services. They're worried about two things. They're worried about self-governing and how to enforce it. So perhaps some of you do know the council there get more intimate uh, information. But what that led me to think is that there's apt to be some complaints. And as the realtor that I am, I know that we're the first target of receiving complaints, and it would go in a variety of ways, as you would guess. Uh, be it disclosure, be it failure to uh, adequately tell the buyers, uh, perhaps there'll be some perception about decline in property values. That's yet to be uh, objectively determined. I haven't known any appraisers who have given me that information. But when you assemble all the potential types of calls, um, the less than friendly neighbor now, um, the major destroyer of chickens actually is the dog, uh, the dog that was next door perhaps. And then we heard tonight um, what chickens can attract, uh, the, the raccoons, the possums, and et cetera, the snakes, and, and so on. And I don't pretend to get into that scientific part of it, but I just want you to know my concern is that there will be complaints. And that's a dimension of this problem, one to be uh, considered. And I don't think I'm suggesting, just as the Clovis Council didn't suggest, that you not do something, but you adequately look at the concerns before you put it into operation as to how it can be, how it can be effectively administered. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Newton. Mm -hmm. Next two speakers, please, Madam Clerk. We have Callie Beckwith and Karen Ash. Good evening. Welcome. I'm Callie Beckwith, and I want to share with you a photo of my bananas that I'm currently growing. This is thanks to our chicken manure. So we have a quarter acre lot, and um, we grow over a thousand pounds of organic food in our yard. In. And that's not, um, it is a luxury, but it's also a necessity, as it is for many, many homes in, in Bakersfield. So I'm in support of hens for the food sovereignty that it provides and the um, organic eggs. Um, I want to address the concern about safety and um, certain illness and death for neighbors that has been, um, you know, sort of brought up as a, as a point of contention. So we, we have the evidence kind of, of anecdotally that they've been allowed in, the Ker in Kern County for years, as well as surrounding counties. So um, counties much bigger than us, we're the ag capital of the world, basically, and yet we don't allow them for our own residents. So I think that's... Um, that's telling that we haven't had these issues come up in actuality. But also, um, I looked into the evidence a little bit, and there was a report published in December 2017, and it was a meta-analysis of the actual incidence of uh, salmonella from backyard chickens from 1990 to 2014. In those 24 years, there were 53 outbreaks and 109 per year cases of illness related to backyard chickens. So. Um, if you look at that on the population, that's 0 .0000034 per year for the entire U.S., and um, it's 0 .034 per 100,000 residents. So I think the, the actual risk is very small, and we should focus on, um, you know, the same thing. It, they're pets, and we care for them. Um, but more importantly, the report indicated what we can do to mitigate those risks, and there's some very simple things. Wash your hands, don't kiss your chickens, that was actually a point. Um, remove wet manure, change your clothes if you've you know, cleaned out the coop, um, and sanitize equipment. So there are ways to mitigate these risks, and it doesn't mean that there's going to be salmonella jumping fences all of a sudden. The other point I want to make is that um, you know, dogs are also dangerous. We have 4.4 million bites per year per the CDC from dog bites alone, as well as salmonella and all the other risks they come with. Um, the other thing is that thousands of city residents already own chickens. And I talked to 
the feed supply roundup on Rosedale Highway. During the shutdown, which was the spring season, they sold 1,000 young hens or pullets per week for 10 weeks straight. Middle of Rosedale Highway, we can assume that many of those were actually families within the city. Um, so, you know, they're already here and it hasn't been an issue and it hasn't been an issue for many, many, many other counties around us. So I urge you for your support and um, that you really look at the impact of local families and not just profits and those that live in estates. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Beckwith. Next two speakers, please. We have Karen Ash and M.T. Miracle. Hi, I'm Karen Ash. I live in the city of Bakersfield in the R1 area. I'd just like to respond to the last lady's comment about the feed store out on Rosedale Highway. That is all zoned out there for animals. They're zoned where they can have a horse, they can have FA, uh, the FA, FFA projects, fair projects. They're zoned. They're city, but they're zoned for animals. Now, our area, we, I've been in my house for 22 years. I'm now retired, and I really enjoy my house. I'm one of the areas that she talked about with a real shallow backyard. I don't even know if I'm 50 feet from my neighbor's fence. If they build a chicken coop on that fence by my patio, when I go out there in the mornings or in the evenings to barbecue or have my family over, we're gonna have that nuisance of the chickens there. And they can say what they want. I was a farm girl, I was raised on a farm. Chickens are noisy. They say, oh, they're, they're kids' pets. Oh, but the kid's gonna have to wash your hands and do this. How many kids do you know that's gonna be playing out in the yard with a chicken or a dog or go in and wash their hands, even during this COVID thing. But anyway, I just want you to know, I'm totally against having chickens in our area when there's so many areas that allow them. And the thing, one other point. First, they start with the chickens. Then you're gonna have a fair project. Oh, we want a goat. How many goats are we going to allow in this R1 area? It has to all come before the council again. So I just think that there's a place for chickens, there's a place for goats, there's a place for dogs and cats, but our area is not ready for chickens. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sash. Next two speakers, please. We have M.T. Marikel and Jack Marikel. Welcome. Please introduce yourself. Well, welcome again. <laughs> MT Miracle. I've enjoyed the democratic process of working openly and publicly with our city government and community members over these past many months while moving towards amending the city ordinance to allow for backyard hens. This process has been transparent and available to all. Backyard hen support is everywhere in our community. It is not limited to a political view age, geographical location, language, or economic status. The benefits are inclusive. Because of this, I have met so many new friends that I probably would not have met. These new friends are intelligent, responsible, and respectful. They are great citizens of Bakersfield. The number of supporters of Backyard Hens continues to grow. Our online petition has 1,229 signatures. Our weekly average visitors to the website continues to increase. Last week it rose by 43%. The Facebook page has over 500 members. There was a poll on a local talk radio show that had over 300 participants where the results were overwhelmingly 91% in favor of backyard hens to only 9% opposed. I hear from individuals constantly that believe backyard hens is the right thing to do. Our community accepts backyard hens Thank you for aligning our practices and beliefs by amending the current ordinance. In Stockton, California, this month, city council members unanimously approved backyard hens for its residents. 
I've provided you a copy of the article. Allowing backyard hens is happening up and down California and across our nation, even in our current situation, because backyard hens are safe and they enhance the quality of life experience for families. Many of these benefits provide social, emotional comfort and physical health for residents. Cities are not revoking backyard hen ownership during these times. Instead, cities continue to approve the practice because it is safe. Council members, you are in good company with many other intelligent and caring leaders like the ones from Stockton, California, who recently unanimously approved backyard hens when you continue to say yes to our request. In the spirit of collaboration, working together to find common ground and to compromise, Bakersfield Urban Backyard Hens Group supports the more restrictive ordinance with the 30-foot setback requirement. Thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Maracal. And the next speaker, Jack Maracal. And after this, a break has been requested, so we'll break after. Welcome. Hello. My name is Jack Maracle. I have researched the topic of Newcastle and would like to provide you with what I have learned. The following statements come directly from the California Department of Food and Agriculture, the CDFA's official website, from a brochure they have titled, quote, Newcastle Disease Information for Bird Owners, end quote. I have provided you a copy of that document. Number one, quote, human health is not a food safety concern. Properly cooked poultry products are safe to eat, end quote. Two, quote, in rare cases, humans that have exposure to infected birds may get eye inflammation or mild fever-like symptoms. These signs generally resolve without treatment. Infection is easily prevented, end quote. Three, the CDFA's recommendation to keep flock safe, quote, keep your birds area clean, keep new birds away from your flock for 30 days before introducing them to the flock so you may watch for illnesses. Do not borrow equipment, or if you do, please make sure to disinfect it first. End quote. Four, there was an outbreak in Southern California a few years back. The backyard hen community acted responsible and the issue was contained and eradicated. During this time, never was the practice of backyard hens banned. Backyard hen ownership continued during this period and after. This is an example of a success story worthy of celebrating because the backyard hen community demonstrates that it is responsible and are capable pet owners. Number five, because human exposure is quote rare, and the result of, quote, eye inflammation that, quote, generally resolves without treatment, the suggestion is for bird owners is to wash their hands after, reading, after handling birds. Newcastle is not a major nor dangerous threat to humans. Mergo, I have watched the hand washing video that, video that you commissioned titled The Bakersfield Wash. It is very well done and it is a lot of fun. It has been shared with the backyard hen community and is currently on the Bakersfield Urban Backyard Hens website as a resource for all residents. Thank you. Thank you, council members, for, and thank you for listening to these facts regarding Newcastle that have been taken directly from the CDFA's official website. Thank you, Mr. Miracle. Thank you. And we will take a pause here. There are, I think, about 15 more to go. And let's take seven minutes, please. Okay, let's um, continue. Our meeting, Madam Clerk, uh, would you please call the next two speakers and there there's room right here once you come up here stand on each of those little blue dots uh, but Luke you come up first and then we have Patricia Vargas Patricia Vargas if you can get in place uh, go ahead and come up Luke welcome please introduce yourself uh, Patricia if you just come on all the way up so we can move it along thank you thank you Mary Go. my name is Luke Miracle I'm a senior at BHS with a 4.0 GPA, GPA, and I plan to major in environmental engineering next year at university. I read the other day where an individual commented on a possible concern of decreasing property values if backyard hens are approved. That concern did not sound accurate to me and came across in the, contents, the context of what I was reading as a stretch, so I decided to research it. After extensive research on the topic, I found that there was no evidence that this is true. I believe this statement is an example of an attempt to create fear based on a maybe statement. My research clearly indicated that property value is determined by the following, location, um, supply, and demand. In fact, one could easily make the case that backyard hens 
increased property values. The following cities had had increasing values of their homes and neighborhoods over the years. LA, San Diego, Seattle, and New York. All of them allow urban backyard hens. The lady who was spearheading the efforts to allow for backyard hens that was interviewed in a recent article about how Stockton, California, where the council members unanimously approved urban backyard hens is a real estate agent. A real estate agent whose income and livelihood depends on property values in support of working with the city of Stockton to allow hen ownership. Knows that property values are not affected by the practice of hen ownership. Thank you for listening to the facts and not the inaccurate fear creating statement of what I read. Your yes vote for backyard hens increases the quality of life experiences for families. When quality of life experiences increase for neighborhoods, so do property values. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Congratulations on your 4.0 and go drillers. Welcome, please introduce yourself. Hi, good evening, my name is Patricia and I support Backyard Hens. And like most of the educators that are here today have mentioned how hens are really good for the kids. I do believe that it is a great big part of their child development, especially right now during COVID times. A lot of the community has mentioned that this is not the time, it's not needed right now to have this pass, but I believe this is the right time. This is the time that we should be uh, thinking of our children uh, because they are the ones that need it the most right now during these COVID times. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Vargas. Next two speakers, please. We have Melissa Alsop and Mike Lyons. Thank you. Welcome, Ms. Alsop. Good evening. Thanks so much to city staff for all the hard work that you've done on this. There's a lot of work going into that, and I really appreciate that. I cannot believe how much fear-mongering there's going on tonight here with people. Ryan and I kept hens for three years in Laguna Niguel, where um, property values are skyrocketing. And my, our buyers actually asked to keep our coop when we left because they loved it so much. And I never had a problem with ammonia smell or anything like that. So I don't know what all that is about. I'm guessing those people have never kept chickens on their own. They don't understand what really goes into it and how easy they are to care for. I would say easier than a dog to care for. Um, I just wanted to ask for your support tonight for a change in the ordinance to allow hens. We had to give up our hens when we left Laguna Niguel because it wasn't allowed in the city and Ryan refuses to break a rule. So um, I think for us, uh, the, hens, the hens were a great um, teaching tool for our kids. We got them at a week old and raised them in our house until we moved them into their own coop. We never had a problem with salmonella or anything else. Um, we, we found that they made very sweet pets. They gave our kids a chance to understand how food is raised and grown and how important it is to take care of the environment that the animals we use to nourish our bodies um, are to be cared for well and responsibly. Um, I think the people that are worried about the noise situation, um, chickens cluck at about 70 decibels, dogs are at about 100. Um, so I think th that argument is kind of moot at this point. Um, I think that the reality is, and I hope you guys all know this too, that, that not everybody's gonna keep hens. Might be one out of 100 residents in Kern County or Bakersfield to keep them, and I think it would be something that would enhance Kern County and Bakersfield. It would be an enticement for people moving here who want a bigger lot, who want to have a lot like Callie over here where she's raising her own food. And we're getting more of those people now from LA because they are distance working. And let's, let's make Bakersfield just a little bit better by allowing them to live the life that they would like to, to live. Um, we will join 95% of the most populous cities in America that allow hen keeping. Cities like Austin, Texas, San Diego, Long Beach, Ventura, Stockton <laughs> now also have them. I think we'd be in great company there and I think giving your residents the freedom to, to do the things they'd like to do within an ordinance like this would be great. So thanks again for all your hard work. I appreciate it. Have a good night. Thank you, Ms. Alsop. Next two speakers, please. Mike Lyons and Wendy Kaff. Michael. Mr. Lyons, are you still here? Let's go on to uh, Wendy Kapp. 
Okay, uh, next two speakers, please. Kevin Lugo and Kirk Boland. Mr. Lugo? Mr. Lugo? Can, um, Mr. Boland. Oh, Mr. is that you, Mr. Logo? Yes. Lugo? Come on up. Wendy. Wendy. Welcome, please introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Wendy Kaff. This is Cassidy Kaff, and we are in support of Backyard Hens for uh, the responsibility of being able to teach Cassidy how to uh, be a responsible pet owner and also, uh, we believe that during this time, we need to have some social skills for our kids and really, really uh, branch out and teach some responsibility right now. So thank you. Thank you very much. Next two speakers, please. Kevin Lugo and Kirk Boland. Good evening, council members. Um, I'm here to express my support for backyard hens. I'm not here to give you any more reasons on why they are they do enhance our quality of life. I feel like everybody that spoke before me and everybody that's going to speak after me has already done that enough. Um, one thing that's obvious after after this entire discussion is that there is a minority of people of the opposition um, trying to tell you that backyard hens won't enhance our quality of life. Um, I don't see a lot of facts bring up. And I, there's a whole room of people out there that are supporting this movement, a massive community. It's obvious to see that the minority isn't really worried about the hazards or the health concerns, but it is more of like one of the other speakers has said, um, an, an issue, a concern for complaint. It is a nuisance to them, not really an issue for, for health concerns. So again, I just want you guys to, to take into consideration the, the community and the room full of people out there that is full of advocates trying to get this passed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lugo. Next two speakers, please. Kirk Bolin and Priscilla Russell. Okay. Good Welcome. evening, council members. Uh, my name is Kirk Bolin. I live in Ward 4. During this COVID-19 pandemic and the broken food chain supply, we've seen products such as eggs not available at the grocery stores. And when they were available, they lent they were sometimes limited. The passage of this ordinance would support a sustainable food system by providing an affordable, healthy, and nutritious source of protein through the production of fresh eggs. COVID-19 is not a reason to delay the passage of this ordinance. It is more of a reason to allow back backyard hens. Since the COVID-19 has started, cities across the country have started allowing backyard hens. As MT mentioned, Stockdale just approved theirs earlier this month. I also found other, other cities that approved it this year during COVID-19. Hanford, California, La Mesa, California, Prairie Village, Kansas, Hopkins, Minnesota, Alpharetta, Georgia, Princeton, New Jersey, Amory, Wisconsin, Lincoln, Illinois, and Baxter, Minnesota. On top of that, there are many other cities in the same situation our city is in, and are, and are in the process of, of drawing up a new ordinance to allow backyard hens. All these cities have some regulations similar to the regulations proposed in the draft presented before council. We believe that both the 12 hens at 30 feet setback and the staggered four at 10, six at 15, eight at 20, whichever the council decides would be a great addition to the city of Bakersfield. I myself have, con have contacted many cities to see how their, their ordinance worked. Six of those replied back. They all said that there is no significant number of calls or problems with their ordinances. As far as the scare tactics being used here tonight, the LA County Health and the CDC Health Department and the CDC all said that to minimize the Newcastle disease and salmonella is just is wash your hands, keep things clean, which is something we should all be doing right now anyways. And I want to uh, mention one more thing. Roundup may be in an area that's zoned for chickens, but there's no homes around that area. And those 
those chickens are going somewhere. So I thank you for your time, and uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Boland. Next three speakers, please. We have Priscilla Russell and Becky Pelishek. Welcome. Good evening, um, Mayor Go and council members. I just have a brief statement in support of back, backyard hens. Um, I appreciate the initiative, and I appreciate the fact that our community is actually reviewing this and taking all of these aspects into consideration. Um, I think that it would be great for my children to have that privilege of knowing what it's like to have a hen as a pet. Um, I know that we're really quick to look at the fact of all the negative aspects, but like anything else in life, there's always a balance. There's always pros, there's always cons. And as adults and as parents, um, we have a responsibility with our children to show them the right way to be responsible with pets. And I consider hens to be part of that aspect. So I would just like it if you could continue to evaluate this piece and consider um, all of the community members coming together and voicing our thoughts on this. Um, and thank you very much for your time and for your consideration. Have a good evening. Thank you, Ms. Russell. And thank you so much for your support of childhood cancer. I know we couldn't acknowledge it before, but you've been a great advocate and we were able to give you a certificate. So thank you very much. Yes, I appreciate that um, very much. Thank you. Next two speakers, please. We have Becky and Zoe Pelishek. Welcome. Hi, good evening. Um, we just wanted to come and say our support of Backyard Hens. I know we've had a chance to share some of our points before, um, and there's been a lot of great points tonight as well, so we don't want to reiterate those, but um, we did want to give our support and just share a few, a few of our thoughts. So you want to go first, so. Yes, backyard hens uh, can be very good for the environment. They reduce green waste. According to chicagobotanical.com, just four birds can power through over 400 pounds of food waste in a year. And of course, they can eat bugs that are eating up crops. And uh, their waste serves as very good fertilizer. Another thing we wanted to say is that they have minimal noise and that um, sometimes the hens will just make a little noise during the day after they lay an egg, but that's pretty much it. Um, they actually are quieter than dogs. They peak at about 65 decibels. Somebody else said 70, but that's pretty close. Um, roughly the same as a human conversation um, where dogs bark, um, they peak at about 90 to 100 decibels. So, um, and that's from mynorthernbackyard.com. So, we just wanted to say again our support and thank you guys for your time and consideration. Thank you. Next two speakers, please. We have Luke Romani and Ian Elliott. Go ahead and announce them again, please. Luke Romani and Ian Elliott. Welcome. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Luke Romanini, um, and I've owned chickens in the past, and I never experienced home in, uh, human health issues. Uh, I wanted to share with you guys some of the facts regarding salmonella. What I share with you is not my opinion, and it's not hypothetical. The following statements come from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or the CDC's official website. Salmonella is most often spread when a person eats contaminated food. Food is the source for most of these illnesses. Here's a list of foods from the CDC's website from 2018 to 2020 that have been major salmonella outbreaks. Peaches, onions, cut fruit, ground beef, papayas, frozen raw tuna, pre-cut melons, ground turkey, raw chicken products, pasta salad, dried coconut, and raw sprouts. The CDC's statement of where and why salmonella is most common. Salmonella illness is more common in the summer. Warmer weather and unrefrigerated foods create ideal conditions for salmonella to grow. Be sure to refrigerate or freeze perishables. Most people recover without specific treatment and should not take antibiotics. Many different animals and pets can carry salmonella. These animals include turtles, lizards, snakes, frogs, toads, 
parakeets, parrots, wild birds, guinea pigs, fowl, hedgehogs, dogs, cats, and horses, to name a few. The CDC's recommendation for backyard chickens, stay healthy around your backyard flock by washing hands, keeping birds outside your house, and supervising young ch children along, around your flock. The reason for young children's supervision is because they are not mature enough to keep their hands out of their mouths. The adult supervision to support th is to support them with washing their hands after being around the flock. Salmonella is a real topic and one that people should be aware of. However, the main, however, the area of focus as a concern is with food, not backyard hens. The human health risks, risks from contaminated foods is, from the CDC's official website, that most people recover without specific treatment and should not take antibiotics. In my own personal experience with backyard hens, my family was able to enjoy them and we had no complaints uh, from neighbors and the neighbors actually were able to come over and enjoy the hens with us as well. Um, so thank, thank you to everybody for listening. Thank you, Mr. Romanini. Next three speakers, please. We have Ian Elliott and French Torres. Mr. Elliott? Mr. Torres? Good evening, council members. Mr. Gonzalez, you may not remember me, but from you gave me one of my first jobs. I appreciate it. I just wanted to acknowledge you. But from a family of 14, um, I come from 14 brothers and sisters. Uh, we were raised with uh, backyard hens, and I have actually 10 children uh, currently, so I would like to allow my kids to experience that too. So I'm in support of uh, backyard hens. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Torres. Next two speakers, please. We have Jesus Ochoa and Hannah Fortin. Mr. Ochoa. Mr. Ochoa. Okay, we'll move on to um, Ms. Fortin. Welcome. Hello and good evening. Uh, my name is Hannah Fortin and I am here in support of Backyard Hens. I will make this brief, but as a healthcare worker during COVID and the grocery hoarding freak out, um, my coworkers and I seriously struggled to purchase food. Earlier this year, uh, limited store hours, extremely long lines and large disruptions to our um, food supply chain left us taking turns during our lunch breaks and PTO hours in order to uh, purchase food for our friends and family. Um, with the current political and social climate, I'm also not convinced that these things are over. I was fortunate enough to have a friend who owns backyard hens, and I can't stress enough the importance of those delicious and fresh eggs. At times, they fed me breakfast, lunch, and dinner. To the man who spoke earlier that said, go buy your eggs at the store, I hope you never struggle to feed your family. I believe we all should have the right to grow and raise our own healthy food. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Ms. Fortin, and thank you for your service as a health care worker. Next two speakers, please, Madam Clerk. We have Isadora Watt and Miriam Marquez. Ms. Watt. Welcome. And Ms. Marquez, if you're, uh, go ahead and come on up. Welcome. Hi, Council. I'm a senior at Bakersfield High School, and I'm here to show my support for backyard hens. Now, first off, I'd like to implore you guys to listen to the numerous factual arguments provided for backyard hens. Um, there's not much salmonella risk. There's, um, <coughs> it offers fantastic experiences, teaches people about providing their own food, encourages sustainability and learning where your food comes from. When I didn't live in Bakersfield, I had the fantastic opportunity to help raise a pig. And it was one of the most forming experiences in my uh, upbringing, I think. Learning where your food comes from really helps um, develop your personal opinions and your views of how you exist in your community. 
Um, additionally, I'd like to ask if you don't listen to logical fallacies such as the slippery slope or the either or fallacy. Um, a lot of people brought up COVID-19. Who in the C CDC have been telling people that we need to move more away from factory farming and indu industrialized food production and more towards sufficiency and small scale production for years? When it came to the avian flu and the swine flu, if we would have had, um, we would have had more small scale and more humane practices and not so many antibiotics and a very small gene pool because of um, genetic, um, um, genetic um, variations and those kind of antibiotics, we could have avoided a lot of deaths. And I would like to thank you guys for your time and ask you to really consider the facts that have been presented. Thank you. Thank you. Next two speakers, please. We have Miriam Marquez and Zima Richardson. Hi, my name is Miriam Marquez and I am in 100 full support of Backyard Hands. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for your brevity. Uh, next two speakers. We have Zima Richardson and Terry Maxwell. You've had so many people give statistics that I'm not going to go there. I came here actually to uh, meet the mayor for an interview I was doing as a student. I'm going back to get my PhD in communication. And I'm taking as many classes as I can to kind of bring me up to speed where everyone else is. I've been away from schooling for almost 30 years. Um, this is the reason why I would never be a in, in your positions. Ms. Sullivan, I've been seeing you for 30, 40 years, and this is my first time uh, after three decades that I'm coming to address this issue. My father was a World War II veteran for the British Army, and we traveled quite a bit um, even after he retired. Um, and um, one of the jobs he had was to be a consultant for the Pakistan um, newly uh, newly separated Pakistan ammunition factory. To give an incentive to my father to be there, they gave us three servant quarters and a ton of maids and servants came along with that. We were fortunate enough to raise 20, 25 chickens. We had pigeons, we had a horse, we had a brown cow. Somehow brown cows are twins. My twin brother and sister were not allergic to. So we grew up with all these animals, and to this day, and I'm not gonna tell you my age, but almost most of you are younger than me, and I feel 35, and I've told my kids, you are now older than me. I remain in good condition because I grow my own food, I grow my own eggs, I've moved from Rosedale to downtown, so I've had to give my hens away. Um, I save cats and dogs. Please, for Lord's sake, <laughs> your children, uh, people with young kids, they are growing up in the United States in a bubble. You guys are not allowing them to be kids. My daughter is an attorney in New York and owns a boutique law firm. Her kids are being raised in Manhattan in a bubble. When COVID happened, she had to rent a farm in Massachusetts and a farm in Virginia to keep going away from her house. The kids had never run around in a field. They had never felt what a deer was. My heart bled for, for the kids. They, they are studying in Dalton, 54,000 a year. They have every luxury that the world can give them and they did not see live animals. We are making our children into zombies. Let them have chickens, let them play with them, let them cuddle them, let them feel life. Please do not, do not let the children grow up in a bubble. We are killing our society. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mrs. Richardson. Next two speakers, please. Welcome, Mr. Maxwell. Good to see you. My name is Terry Maxwell. Um, 
I wanted to make a mention uh, about that poll that one of the uh, previous speakers talked about. That was on my show, and we asked a question. We normally have, I don't know, 50, 60 people that respond to that. We had over 300, so we really kind of threw that poll out because it was pretty obvious that the results of that poll had been uh, manufactured uh, by a group of people that, that were uh, interested in, in making it look one way and not another. So uh, I, I would also tell you that that is not a scientific poll. It's just listeners and people that call in. So I, I would ask you to disregard that. Second thing is this, this ordinance that we already have. Back in 2013, we looked at this at that time. And we came to the conclusion that the ordinance works. We all know people who have chickens in their backyards. And if you're responsible, keyword responsible, then usually you don't have any problems with your neighbors. They don't complain, they, they think it's, it's great. And a lot of the speakers up here have talked about, oh, we talk to responsible people that want to have these, these chickens. Did you talk to any irresponsible people? Do you know any irresponsible people who are gonna get those chickens they're going to put them out in the backyard. Yeah, we've got these ordinances, and you're supposed to follow these rules, but they don't follow those rules. And the next thing you know, you've got a problem because a lot, a lot of the neighbors are not happy with what's going on. You have to look at the cross-section of Bakersfield. Whenever something like this comes up, you don't see a cross-section of Bakersfield. What you see is people who have a self-interest in wanting everybody else to allow them to have what they want. And I ask you to think about everybody else that is not here tonight but did elect you to do the responsible thing. The responsible thing is to do the same thing we did in 2013 by a vote of five to seven to maintain the ordinance we already have. It works. It's not broken. Uh, as far as somebody saying, well, you know, they did all this hoarding when COVID-19 happened. How often does something like COVID-19 happen? So we're going to change everything because in 20 years, COVID-19, something like that might happen again. I would ask you to think one thing also. Two of the members of this council will not be here after December. If nothing else, table this issue and allow a new council to look at this again. It will then have, you'll have some time. I believe this is nothing more than a fad. And you know, if you put an E on the end of the word fad, that's what they all do is fade. Give this some time, let, let it fed out, let the new council come in, look at it again, and make a decision that is good for the people who have then elected them. Um, also, the last thing is, if you live in an HOA, which a lot of people in Bakersfield do, you will not be subject to this ordinance that you're about to pass. Because HOAs do not allow chickens so if there's anybody up there that lives in an HOA, you're not being honest with yourself because you're not going to be affected by something that you might pass tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Maxwell. And I believe our final speaker. We have Kim Huckabee. <laughs> Welcome, Ms. Huckabee. Thank you, Mayor Go, um, council members. Um, my name is Kim Huckabee. I'm the CEO of the Bakersfield Association of Realtors. Um, I didn't intend to speak tonight. We submitted our comments in writing, but a couple things came up that um, I just felt compelled to, ad to address really quickly. Um, one was value. And then also, um, Gary Crabtree, who is a member of ours, a uh, well-known appraiser, our author of the Crabtree Report, um, had sent me uh, some comments earlier today, and I just wanted to quote him real quick on two things. Um, he said his reaction to what is proposed uh, to you tonight is that hens are farm animals, thus should require RS zoning. If it is proposed that to place the hens in an R1 zone, then rather than changing the zoning, require a conditional use permit, which would allow uh, neighbors to weigh in on the matter. Um, he goes on to list many of the issues we already addressed in our letter. But then finally, um, his biggest concern as far as value goes, goes back to what Mr. Newton was addressing, and that's disclosure. Um, he said 
the fact that realtors would have to disclose this condition on adjacent properties to prevent lawsuits from buyers for non-disclosure. In my opinion, this could be termed as an adverse influence and cause loss in marketability and value. All in all, I think it's a bad idea. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to, prov to provide that. Thank you, Ms. Huckabee. And I believe that concludes our public statement. So at this point, we will return it to Council for comment and action. Council Member Freeman. Thank you, Mayor. <coughs> well, I know most of the people have left, but I want to thank them all for coming down tonight <coughs> and, <coughs> and giving us their ideas. Um, I do believe that everyone who spoke tonight uh, spoke sincerely, and I think the people who are uh, advocates of the backyard hens, I believe all of them would take care of their chickens responsibly. I think they all are, you know, know what they're doing. Um, I don't call them farm people, but some of them clearly have a lot of farm knowledge. So uh, I respect them and I, and I would trust them. Um, I have a little bit bigger issue here. Um, and it isn't deciding whether backyard hens or not definitively a good idea, and I don't think I should make that decision for 85,000 homeowners. Uh, let's say over 300,000 people who aren't here tonight, we've heard 30 people who are in favor of it, and we heard some people who aren't, we have letters that were sort of half and half, 40 of them, uh, 2,300 realtors who are against it, we have a letter from the home building industry, all the builders are against it. Um, there were a lot of issues raised that I think were legitimate that needed to be that need to be vetted further. The health and safety issue, I think clearly we need more research and need to know more about what we're doing, uh, especially when we're not going to have registration or monitoring of any of these backyard hens. Cause, but the bigger issue is we're proposing to change the basic zoning, the most fundamental zoning in Bakersfield for 85,000 homes and all the thousands of homes in the future. We no longer will have R1 zoning. This is a new form of zoning. I think the realtors were right. It should be dealt with in, it, in the proper places, which would be places like the Planning Commission. Um, they normally deal with just changing the zoning one, one project. We're talking about my, a general plan amendment zone change for the entire city of Bakersfield, um, which is pretty extreme in taking away the rights that they moved in to their homes with for the last 50 years. I think they all deserve a say. When we affect 85,000 people, and it does affect the peace and quiet enjoyment of their home. This is, the home is their castle. It's the biggest investment they will ever make in their life. And believe me, people are paranoid about their home and their enjoyment of that property. I get calls from people when someone painted the home the wrong color across the street and they want city action. Anything that affects the value of that home or the quality of life in a neighborhood, these people take seriously. Our people in Bakersfield do. And I think the people who spoke tonight would be responsible with chickens. But we have 85,000 homes, and maybe, maybe we had 1,000 homes represented tonight out of the 85,000. But we're going to change the zoning on an entire city, um, which would be bigger than any general plan amendment in the history of Bakersfield. I think it needs a wider vetting process. I think everybody has a say. I would think there should be some sort of an outreach program to every single ward so we hear from the thousands of people who'd be affected. Um, so I would like to see this, I'm not sure the right body, perhaps be directed to planning commission to thoroughly vet it to outreach in every ward and research this. After the COVID epidemic has died down and we're allowed to have larger public hearings and people feel comfortable to participate, which I would think would be hopefully early next year. But uh, that's, that's my, I just think we have to think about other people. You know, we're, it isn't just my, this is a city wide, this isn't my ward or Bob's ward. And there's all those people who don't even know this is happening. And we kind of have to represent that silent majority. We're here to protect them. Even though they're not here tonight, most of them don't even know that's going on. We haven't done outreach. We haven't done anything to make people know this is happening in the city. 
and it's probably the most dramatic thing we will ever have done. So it may be it is a good idea, but I think all the people deserve a chance to weigh in on this before we do it. So uh, those are my, my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Freeman. Councilmember Gonzalez will be next, followed by Councilmember Weir. Thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, I, too, want to thank all of the speakers tonight. I thought everyone contributed um, a lot, and I appreciate the feedback and the perspectives of, of all those who, who attended tonight and those who wrote us letters and emails and contacted me via phone and text and various other places. Um, thank you for reaching out. Um, wanted to tackle a couple of points that I heard tonight that are of most most concerning to me. One, number one is public health, and I have heard from some of the um, opponents and their concerns related to COVID-19 and um, their their concern specifically regarding the um, Newcastle disease. And uh, and and I also in, earlier in the public comments heard someone mention uh, an individual. Uh, who is living with pulmonary fibrosis. And I will say that I have someone very dear and close to me in my life who is living with pulmonary fibrosis. Um, and so that's a concern of mine as well, especially given uh, the condition that we're in during the pandemic. So that's not something that I personally take lightly. Um, so I actually called the Director of Public Health, uh, Matt Constantine, um, or, or texted him rather a few, few weeks ago to ask him about Newcastle disease and asked him how many cases Kern, Kern County has experienced, because it should be noted that actually within the county, um, chickens, both hens and roosters, are permitted. It's a permitted use. Um, and uh, the number of cases that they've seen in the county are zero, zero. Um, and in fact, the USDA ended the Southern California quarantine on June 1st, 2020. Um, so I understand the concern, but, but for, you know, weighing all things, um, it's not the highest concern for, for me. Um, and then the second thing, you know, I, I appreciate the, um, individual speaker who spoke about their experience in, uh, Laguna Niguel. And I took a survey, just a cursory survey of many of the, uh, communities throughout the state that actually allow for backyard hens. Laguna Beach, San Juan Capistrano, Mission Viejo, San Clemente. I mean, all uh, areas with high property values that only are continuing to increase over time. And as many of the speakers um, spoke of, they, they named many other communities as well. So, so for me, I, 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 I think that the, many of the concerns, um, I think, are legitimate, but perhaps overblown. And I'm in support uh, of the ordinance in general. Um, I'd like to hear from the rest of my colleagues uh, before making further comment. Thank you, Councilmember Gonzalez. Councilmember Weir's next, followed by Councilmember Rivera. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, um, you know, this all started out a few months ago with uh, some people showing up saying they were supporting backyard hens and. It was all well and good. And then the next meeting, uh, more people came in and they were supporting. So we had like five and then there was 10. And then the next meeting, there was 15 or so. Um, and it's kind of just grown in a methodical way, I suppose. And so then we had a couple council members calling down to San Diego and other places and finding out that, um, you know, they haven't had any problems. Uh, to speak of and you know the people that have been coming in and, and uh, talking to us about the the virtues of backyard hens uh, bought property in a town in a zone that doesn't allow backyard hens and somehow now um, a very minor minority of people in the city of Bakersfield are trying to open up zoning for the entire city. It sounds kind of backwards. Um, if these people wanted backyard hens, then there's a place for them. And it's in the county or in the ag zoning or suburban zoning. 
Um, as far as no Newcastle and disease out in the county, you have to understand that most of those county places are, they're not uh, worried about 30 foot setbacks because they have property and those chickens aren't all cooped up and, and intermingling um, like they're gonna have to in these smaller lots. So I think this whole process has been fast tracked. I don't think it's been vetted well. I really believe that the process is a very poor process that we've embarked on. And poor processes for public policy generally yield a poor public policy. And I don't think this is something that we want to experiment with. So if we're going to take a look at this and get a good represented representation from our community, then that's what we need to take the time to do. I don't see that there's any emergency here. I don't, I don't feel like I'm pressured to get this done tonight. It doesn't have to be done tonight. It can be done at any time in the future. So I really don't want to support a poor process, a poor way of developing a public policy that's going to lead to a poor public policy. And, and I cannot believe that the majority of people in Bakersfield uh, really want hens in their neighbor's backyard. It, it is, you know, when my kids are growing up, they had a facility that they could keep hens in and it was uh, zoned properly and my kids would go down and they would take care of it and they'd raise their hens and they'd get the eggs and sell it and you know it's all a great little thing but they weren't doing it in my backyard which would not have been appropriate and i don't think it's appropriate for a small minority of bakersfield residents to expect the entire city uh, to kowtow to what they want without really knowing the results of what that would be. So I think this is a poor decision. I think it's a poor process. And I think the policy is going to end up being a, um, an inferior policy. So I'm not going to support this. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Weir, Councilmember Rivera, and then Councilmember Sullivan. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I have a, I have a few questions for, for staff. I think one of the first that came to mind early on in the meeting was, was on the enforcement front. And I'm kind of curious. We have, we have a, a rule on the books now that doesn't allow uh, backyard hens, but I think everyone in the chambers knows that folks obviously still have backyard hens. Do we receive a lot of complaint calls as code enforcement find themselves responding to a lot of calls right now? Madam Mayor, Councilman, um, per prior uh, investigations and discussing it with code enforcement, staff receives about 10 complaints a year as it relates to backyard hens. Got it. Thank you. Okay. And that's with, that's with, uh, a current rule on, I just want to note that that's with a current rule on the books that doesn't allow it. Um, you know, I, I think when we originally set out um, with, uh, with an ordinance a few weeks back, I, I think the, you know, the, uh, the term easy to understand and easy to follow was used and, and I think that should apply to any action we take this evening. If I am asked to look at option one and option two as it's presented, uh, as it was presented by Mr. Schenauer earlier, uh, it seems to me option two is just a little less easy to understand. And, and I will add that I think it's um, much more difficult to enforce. And I think because of those two things, um, it means it's, it's a bad public policy for this council to, to establish. So um, I'd be in favor of, of moving in a more straightforward direction. On, on a clear, hard and fast rule that people can understand, people can wrap their head around, and we can, we can move on uh, past chickens. It's funny, so I started on the city council in 2013 
And Councilmember Maxwell noted um, that at, in 2013, this uh, city council was talking about chickens. I had actually just missed that debate because I was sworn in just after that uh, discussion happened. And I remember walking around um, or attending community meetings highlighting the fact that I just joined a job or signed up for a job that was going to deliberate the fate of chickens. And here I thought I was going to change the world. Um, and here I am, three months left in my term, um, uh, discussing chickens. Uh, it'll be the last big thing uh, I talk about on the Bakersfield City Council. Uh, so you just kind of got to love how, how, uh, how the world works that way. Um, you know, I mean, full disclosure, and I, I think I've told council members up here, I've, I had two chickens, Betsy and Myrtle, uh, two leghorns in my backyard. They, uh, and so did my neighbors. I never found them to be a nuisance. I imagine I was louder in the shower when I sang than they ever were in their pen. Um, and I thought there was a lot of value uh, in uh, Betsy and Myrtle being a part of my life. Um, I mean, I went the extra step to name the damn thing, so they must have meant something to me. Um, you know, so knowing that, I guess I just have a really hard time um, you know, buying into the notion that there is some, there's uh, some great big threat uh, on the horizon uh, if we decide to make something legal that is already done by so many people in this city anyway. I just have a hard time uh, not ad acknowledging uh, the realities of that um, and, uh, and addressing it and making it so we don't have an outdated rule. I mean, I had those two chickens knowing full well the city didn't allow them because I thought it was a dumb rule. Um, and I know other folks have probably uh, reached that conclusion and may have chickens or have decided to be far more honorable, law-abiding citizens uh, than I was and have held off in having chickens but hope that we might take action tonight to uh, make that possible for them. But uh, I just don't see the... I just don't see, uh, I don't see the threat. Um, you know, and I, I think um, uh, Council Member Weir and Council Member Freeman talked a little bit ab about the process and I heard members of the public um, talk about the, pro uh, the process to date and, uh, you know, the, the need to ensure we have public input and public participation in the wake of COVID-19. But I will tell you um, that in my seven years on the Council, few things have ever been as controversial uh, as uh, backyard hens, and few things ever really generate the type of interest we've, we've gotten. I mean, uh, this is not an, an issue uh, we have deliberated uh, in a silo. We have heard quite a bit uh, from the community. Um, and, you know, I, I'd argue we take actions, we'll take other actions on the agenda tonight that no one will comment on, uh, and that lack of comment should not uh, doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't compel me to not take action. I mean, we voted on a $600 million city budget in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic and received significantly less comments than we've, we've received this evening uh, on backyard hens. Uh, and I'd argue that $600 million budget had far-reaching implications for the 85,000 um, residences that have been, that have been cited. So, I don't think I'm making a, a pressured decision. I don't think um, I'm being forced to make uh, a hasty decision. I think this is uh, the direction we should go in. Um, I'll indulge you know, the rest of the council on, on the direction they want to go. And I understand one last point, um, you know, that we're, we're looking to maybe try and be consistent with the county of Kern on the number of hens, and I get that. Um, I do have... Uh, some hesitations on the on the maximum number of hens we have currently, uh, at least in the language in front of us, of, of 12 hens, e even in, in that small lot size. I do wonder whether, uh, you know, we'd be interested in, in maybe paring that down. It looks like Stockton had a limit of four uh, per household, I think. Uh, and I believe uh, uh, there's a similar trend in other places as well. So. Um, this is a consistent position with what I said at the last council meeting when we talked about this. I haven't changed my mind, and I am uh, ready to take a vote and move on to the next big thing. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Rivera. Councilmember Sullivan. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> well, I was one of the ones on the council nine years ago when this came up, 
And I'm really glad it didn't pass then because it had gotten so complicated. And so we did, I do appreciate the fact that, that it's, it has come back in a very simple way. It, it's really, it's really a, a great issue. And I have to say, it has really touched me. The families that are here tonight and the all ages, and uh, they enjoy, they, they're having the opportunity to, to raise chickens. And, um, you know, all of the, they say all of the people, well, not all of the people are going to want to. And I live in an HOA. And so we don't have, we don't have uh, fences in our backyard. We don't have backyards, actually. But I, I just think it's, it's wonderful. I, I appreciate the, the families that are here that are, that are either into health, raising their, their chickens for healthy, um, healthy eggs. But my guess is that probably just as important as the healthy eggs is just teaching their, their kids responsibility and just giving them the opportunity to experience that. How nice. It's, it's really very touching to me. I think it's great. If, if I had to do it over again, uh, if my children, if I was a young mom with my young children, I would have chickens. I, it, I think it would be fun. I think it would be great. And you know, it was interesting. Someone brought out that the, that the, um, that the loudness level uh, and and I, I, I don't remember the, the, the number of decimals, but yet that it, the equivalent of people talking. So that was interesting. And, uh, and really, I've, I've um, you know, in fact, two people, uh, one called me yesterday and then one called me this morning. The one yesterday was saying that she takes a walk every morning. She's in my ward, takes a walk every morning, and she hears, she hears, roosters crowing and she's sure glad they don't live right next to her and so i i told her okay we'll take a pencil and paper and get try to find the address of where you're hearing the the the, the roosters crowing because that's not what the issue is we're not talking about roosters we're talking about hens and they definitely in fact i've i've been reminded of something two types male and female it's the males that, that crow, but this is for the females. This, this is for the hens that can be pets, teach children responsibility, and uh, produce eggs. So if, it's not about, it's not about uh, roosters. And at the last meeting, someone mentioned that, that um, uh, pet o that stores that, that sell hens, if they, end up selling a chick that ends up being a rooster, they'll even take it back. So, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure that would be true. But I, I think it's great that, um, that this has come up again. I'm delighted. I'm, there are two of us that will not continue on uh, after this coming election. So I'm, I'm glad I'm one of the ones now because I can vote on it. And I'm strongly in favor. I'm, I'm, I'm strongly in favor. I think it's wonderful. And anybody that is not interested, that doesn't want to for any reason, they're not going to. But there are many right now that are, and in fact, Melissa, in fact, she went to school with my daughter, Melissa. Um, uh, she said that her husband, would, they would like to, to have hens, but they won't do it because they're, they're not supposed to, and he's with the county, so he needs to be very careful. I think it's, uh, why should families have to be worried about breaking, law, breaking rules? This is not a rule that's going to be, um, that's not going to be a problem. And several things that I wrote down, uh, must keep the coops clean. Okay, that's, well, probably, that's a, an important thing. That's fair, that's an important thing. We have to pick up after our dogs. Um, so that is an important thing. Okay, quality of life for families. Gosh, that sounds wonderful to me. Quality of life for families. Yeah, that, that's, that's important. Okay. Um, oh, okay, and the loudness. Yes, I, I'm glad that was brought up. That, that was interesting to me. 
Okay, and, and one of the young ladies that as she was leaving uh, her, her comments, she was saying, please give us the right to grow, to grow uh, and uh, provide our own food. That doesn't sound, I mean, that sounds wonderful. So she, they're going to enjoy that. So I'm, I'm in favor of it. I'm glad it has come up this year. I, I'm, I'm glad I'm, a, I'm ha having the opportunity to be part of this decision. I feel really good about it. And I, I commend the families that, um, that, are, uh, that are doing this and, and giving their children the opportunity. Two young men here in, uh, that spoke very well. And it'll be a story you tell to your children. You will remember it forever. And if you live in a place, I'm sure you'll, you'll end up having, having hens. So I think it's great. Um, and the, the, TV, the radio host, I am, it's a little amusing to me that it came out so strongly in favor of, of people in favor of hens, you threw it out. You threw out the survey. That, that, you know, there were so many people in favor, so few against, you threw out the survey. I mean, that, that, that's, that's interesting to me. That, uh, that is hilarious, Terry. That is really <laughs> funny. I mean, that, is, that is really funny. Okay, well, I will be voting soon, and I will vote in favor, and uh, I want everyone to be responsible. I want it to be a good experience. I, I want it to, uh, and I think it will, and it will teach responsibility. And the people that have health issues, I'm sure they're not going to have chickens, and don't go visit anybody that, that has chickens. That's easy. So um, I think it's great. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Sullivan. Councilmember Smith. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I would just respond to a couple of things that uh, comments been made that you know this is a rush decision, and, and but repeatedly we've we've talked about how you know we've looked at this eight years ago, and and so I don't think eight years is rushing a decision. At that time, San Diego and Sacramento were just passing their ordinances, and those are you know cities that we followed up with now, and and they've had them for eight years, and and they are not seeing problems and they both definitely are not experiencing depreciation of real estate. We have the most affordable real estate in the state. Maybe that's because we don't allow hinge yet. I don't know. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> I do think uh, we are a family friendly community and this is a great family activity. Teaches responsibility to children. Uh, which we all want and I don't like the idea of building a society around the irresponsible people we you know we are a free society and I believe in building society around responsible citizens and freedom so I am for the ordinance I, I personally like the option number two I, you know, looking at the the smaller lots with option one, there, there was very little space to locate the pins, and so I, and you know, small lots maybe you know four hands makes more sense, but we give them more of an option. So I will make the motion for option number two, and that is my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Smith. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Boyle, if you'd come back, please. Can you just give me a little background since you oversee the Code Enforcement Department, um, kind of the duties and responsibilities, and I believe you're down three positions uh, because of budget freezing, and uh, is that unit impacted currently due to its responsibilities? Uh, Mayor Goh, uh, Vice Mayor Parlier. Uh, the Code Enforcement Division currently is down three bodies. So essentially, there are seven employees within the Code Enforcement Division. And if you do the math, the Code Enforcement Division, therefore, then each of those individuals roughly manages 
an area of about 22 square miles and is responsible for about 55,000 citizens in the city. Those same seven individuals um, right now obviously have a backlog of cases that they have to respond to. Um, about a 10 day backlog on just citizen complaints that come through the various hotlines and the like. And at the same time, we, we actively are engaged in, in meeting the, the uh, requests of the council through its council referral system. And um, we work really hard through the city manager in meeting all of those needs. In, so I would say right now that the, the department of seven, which are all general funded positions, which is why we have a hiring freeze on those particular positions, um, are stressed within, within their daily workloads, yes. So you said there, currently there's, well, past statistics there's been 10 uh, complaints per year. Let's say that goes to 100 because as an institution, I know people have them in their backyard and some folks have them in their backyard, but as a government institution saying that, you know, we condone this activity and so there may be an increase in complaints. So let's say they're 50 or they're 100 or it exponentially grows through the next few years, uh, how are you going to be able to enforce that at your current position level? Well, mindful that uh, the city manager or the council asked code enforcement to prioritize that, I would, I would respond in this, in this way. Because um, there has been some dialogue on the part of development services as to how we might respond to that. Um, and this is what I would say. First, the code enforcement division, um, when you look at the, the two positions that we have here tonight, um, there's a group of individuals who are responsible, upstanding citizens and have a certainty that they're going to um, uphold the laws and install the proper coops and maintain those coops in a certain way and the like. And um, there are also, as some people have noted, um, irresponsible individuals. And the Code Enforcement Division typically is uh, versed in dealing with irresponsible individuals. And the question has been all along, well, how, how many of those individuals are going to fall into that irresponsible category? And that's a difficult one because when you look at the ordinance in its present form, and I'm speaking only from dialogue from a staff level, there, there isn't any required permit because of the council's desire for a permissive ordinance. So there's no way for staff to actually go out onto a site and confirm that those requirements that are there are in place uh, purposefully because that's the purpose of the ordinance as, as designed by council. So when staff is going to be called into the field is when there are problems and there may be more problems because there isn't any really real review in place out in advance of any allowance. Two, the enforcement of the use is also, you'd have to perceive it as being an unfunded uh, activity because typically permits would fund any type of con code enforcement activity and in this particular instance, any enforcement on this particular level will be a, a general fund funded type of activity because none of the permits that might have been entertained would be in place to provide for some backstop to those costs. Now, there's a motion on the table for option two, uh, which I believe is better than 12 hens, uh, but with those setback limits at 10, 15, 20 feet, I believe, is that correct, Bob? And 30. And 30. What would the enforcement mechanism look like? How would a code enforcement officer be able to determine that? Or are they going to have to walk around with a tape or something to, to measure distances? Or well, It certainly adds a dynamic because um, as option one would provide for a simple 30-foot setback to coop from adjoining properties, um, you have a, a, a uniform number, maximum of 12 hens and the like. Um, when you move to option two, 
then the number of hens determines the actual setback to joining properties. It's a little bit uh, alarming when you've got a 10 foot setback for, for birds because really you have about 10 foot of separation between structures. So it, the only location where a coop wouldn't be allowed for would be in those immediate side yards of a person's home. Um, but that's at the discretion of the council as it relates to um, what you feel is an appropriate, a, appropriate place to, to call those setbacks. From a simple enforcement perspective, much easier. 30 feet, number of birds, go out and with your tape measure, say there's 30 foot, your coop is 30 foot from joining properties. One, two, three, four, less than 12, we're good. Well, you bring up a good point there because you say 30 feet from the coop or 10 feet or whatever the case may be, but I believe under the current uh, new ordinance as drafted that uh, the hens don't have to be in a coop until uh, uh, nighttime or dusk. That's correct. They're so essentially you're going to have free roaming chickens up until somebody decides to put them in a coop. In the backyard. It's in the backyard. Yeah, yeah, you're going to have free-ranging chickens in people's backyards in, until somebody puts them in a coop. Yeah, nighttime hours, the requirement per the ordinance would be at nighttime hours, chickens would be, re hens would be required to be uh, kept in their coop. Yes, sir. Now, when we looked at other city ordinances, were they required to be kept in a hen house? Or did they allow free-ranging in people's backyards? Um, there's a wide range there. Um, I think you'd probably be looking at about 50-50 uh, there in terms of um, the, the degree of restrictions there. Um, you know, uh, thinking back to our workshop in August, you have a, a, a wide scope in terms of minimum lot sizes as being one measure to, uh, to police where hens are allowed for, and the other side would be setbacks. And the 30 foot is the smallest degree of setback that's there. Um, per, per the 10 comparables we used. Um, there are some cities required permits, some did not. Um, some, some require hens to be essentially retained in coops. Others are very comfortable with rear yard um, free range per se, rear yard free ranging per se. It's really at the, each of those councils have to come to a decision where that, where that comfort zone is that provides compatibility with the use and, and its surrounding neighbors. Okay, well, let's say some of those folks, besides the good folks that are here tonight and seem like responsible people, uh, don't lock their hens up at night, and it becomes a, an issue because they're, you know, if Mr. Smith's motion doesn't pass that you have uh, 12 chickens running around, um, there would probably be some added code enforcement complaints. I would guess that there would be code enforcement complaints. One of the reasons why, in my research, we're leading up to your workshop, that hens were kept in coops at night is because hens like to, to roost. And um, a chicken coop provides for a protected roost area um, that doesn't lead to chickens roosting on fence lines or tree branches or things like that. Mindful that hens are birds. And so there's a, there's a rationale why chickens are, are kept in, in coops in the evening hours because it's a comfort zone for them. They feel protected. As long as there's no incursion of uh, vermin and things like that, whether that's skunks or rats or what have you, that's a safe, secure location for hens to call home when they're left their own devices, like all birds would do, they'll find an alternative location to roost. And that can be in trees, on, in, in an urbanized area, along fence lines, and that would lead to a potential um, higher degree of code enforcement response calls and, and requests for response, yes. That's where that, that question mark as it relates to um, the degree of irresponsible people that code enforcement is so comfortable dealing with comes into play. Okay, well you mentioned fence lines and even hens, if they don't have their wings regularly clipped, I'm not sure what the, the time frame is, but I know they have to have their wings clipped, otherwise they can fly at least a, a bit 
And uh, do you have any idea, can they clear a fence line if they are able to get a certain height? Sure, well, I'm going with uh, the experience of my youth and uh, my chickens, if I didn't maintain my chickens, they, they could uh, get some air and uh, could clear a six foot fence without trying too hard. I think that that's a, that's a fair statement that if one doesn't maintain and clip, clip wings that hens are gonna be mobile. Thank you, Mr. Boyle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Madam City Attorney, there was, kind of got different information from different folks. Uh, some, they, some said they want to keep them as pets. Some said they want to keep them as food. Uh, is that allowed? Can people eat their chickens if they raise them here? Mayor, Councilmember Parlier, under the ordinance is currently drafted, you may only slaughter hens in the M3 zone. So they would not be allowed to slaughter their hens in any of the R zones. Okay. Yeah, I understand, but there was direct comments, uh, Councilmember Sullivan, regarding people eating hens. Mr. City Manager, CBAC, our animal control facility, what's their policy receiving uh, hens when they're on the loose? Uh, or collecting hens or uh, honorable mayor and council vice mayor uh, my, my understanding from staff is that uh, CBAC uh, it's not part of their scope of services currently um, to um, to have a program for you know receiving surrendered hens thank you well listening to my colleagues it sounds like um, speaking in the minority uh, but I think we're being extremely short-sighted I understand council members are council members up until they leave the dais, but I think on something as important as this, as council member Freeman stated, changing an ordinance, it's gonna affect potentially 85,000 residents that the courtesy would be allowed for those folks to make that decision. I think we are opening ourselves to problems and if it does pass tonight, I would say that in uh, couple of years we may be back here talking about this topic again but not approving but retracting this ordinance I think it should go through the proper process of, uh, of zoning and being vetted properly there and then coming back I would like to make a motion that I think is going to fail but that we table this issue and or it goes through the proper procedures thank you mayor thank you vice mayor councilmember Sullivan Okay, <clears throat> well, it's possible that some of those 10 complaints were a matter of my neighbor has hens and I don't think they're supposed to have hens or chickens or hearing roosters. So, you know, to be, and how long you've been, you're a little short staffed and how long has that been? A while, right? <clears throat> That's okay, you can just shake your head. Okay, it's been a while. And, 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 you know, we've all survived. And I would not, um, hold on. Excuse me. I, I would not, you know, this is for people. This is giving people the opportunity to do something. The people that don't want to do it, they don't have to do it. Um, they, they will not have hens um, for, for whatever reason too much work, rather buy them. Um, all of those reasons are good, valid reasons. But this is giving people the, that want to have hens uh, able to have hens. So I'm not too concerned about it being a few more telephone calls for code enforcement. I mean, that, that, that might happen, um, but it might also, it might also eliminate um, some of the calls when the, the, the people, you know, when, when a person realizes that it's okay for them to have hens. So I, I just think it's wonderful and, and um, I'm, I'm very strongly in favor. I, I'm delighted that it's coming up again now. Uh, while I'm still on the council, I can, I, can, I, can, uh, help, I can support this and help this to be possible for families in Bakersfield. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Sullivan, Vice Mayor. 
Thank you. I'd just like to add that we've gotten along with reduced code enforcement officers. Well, getting along and being effective are two different things. And I tell you what, in my area, and I know some other councilmen uh, that are on this dais too, could use the whole code enforcement department just within their ward and uh, still be plenty busy. So putting extra burdens on city staff, I don't think are necessary at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Councilmember Smith. Thank you, Mayor. The, the conversation about code enforcement is theoretical, and, but there, are, there is data from cities up and down the state, and we called them, and the proponents emailed others, and they all stated, it's not a problem. Not that many people really get the chickens in the first place, and the ones that do are responsible. So, you know, what ifs are not what is. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Smith. Councilmember Rivera. This, is, this could go on for a long time, but I, I want to hone in on this code enforcement thing because I'm kind of confused. What does the staffing in our code enforcement department have to do with the number of complaint calls we get? I mean, I don't understand. I'm not sure I understand the nexus. Are we not, are we not answering the phone because we have less staff? Uh, if I may, uh, Mayor and, and Council, uh, Council Member, I, I think the question is about our ability to, to respond out to the field and address, you know, the timeliness in which we can address uh, requests. But no, we, we are absolutely answering phones and we're receiving those complaints. Um, and um, uh, it may be a little bit out of context, but I would say that our, our code enforcement team, I think Mr. Boyle has uh, been diplomatic, but we are uh, stressed on code enforcement, but I don't think it's unique to this issue. I think it's uh, relative to many issues. Uh, so I just wanted to take that opportunity to, to reflect that um, it may be an area for council consideration on, a, on broader issues for code enforcement, but I don't think it's unique to this issue. Thank you, I, I would completely agree. Um, and if I were Mr. Boyle, I'd be taking this down and coming back next budget cycle when I'm not here anyway, so it doesn't matter, and getting those positions funded because I imagine you're gonna have a whole lot more issues to deal with uh, in responding to complaints that has nothing to do with chickens that I think we should equip you better for, so thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Rivera. Councilmember Gonzalez. Yeah, thank you. I wanted to also piggyback on this code enforcement issue um, because I don't, I don't understand the nexus either. I, I, the, the, the issue related to code enforcement capacity ought to be addressed at the next budget cycle. And, and we ought to increase the, the staffing, the complement of our code enforcement department. Uh, we have four unfilled positions. I'm interested in hearing what our strategy is to fill those. Uh, you know, but w adding capacity seems like the solution to this. And we, yes, we have lots of code enforcement issues. I have lots of code enforcement issues in War Two uh, that we have to address. I, I don't, I don't see how that is related to this, or that's not a, a legitimate enough reason for, for me, to, um, to hold off on this particular policy change. Thank you, Councilmember Gonzalez, Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Boyle. Your normal staff code enforcement, if they walked in a backyard, can they tell the difference between a hen and a rooster just by looking at them, if they're not making any noise? Thank you, Vice Mayor. I should certainly, certainly hope so. They can. Okay. Good enough. I called a question. Thank you. We have a motion. Uh, we have two motions on the floor. We'll take uh, Vice Mayor's. <laughs> First, and Madam Clerk. Just for clarification, that is a motion to table the topic. Vice Mayor Parlier? Aye. Council Member Rivera? No. Council Member Gonzalez? No. <coughs> Council Member Weir? Yes. Council Member Smith? No. Council Member Freeman? Yes. Council Member Sullivan? No. Motion fails. Thank you, Madam Clerk. So we'll take Council Member Smith's motion and 
Council Member Smith, would you like to restate it? It's been a little while. It was option two. Yes, so that's a motion for first reading of option two, and then we can um, have the first reading of the cleanup ordinances second, uh, Council Member Smith, if you would. You need two motions for that? Yes, please. Okay. Okay, we have a motion. Madam Clerk. Vice Mayor Parlier. No. Council Member Rivera. Aye. Council Member Gonzalez. Aye. Council Member Weir. No. Council Member Smith. Yes. Council Member Freeman. No. And Council Member Sullivan. Yes. Motion is approved with Council Members Parlier, Weir, and Freeman voting no. Thank you. Council Member Smith. I would like to make the motion for the cleanup ordinances to be consistent with the motion just passed. Madam Clerk. Vice Mayor Parlier. No. Council Member Rivera. Aye. Council Member Gonzalez. Aye. Council Member Weir. Council Member Weir. Do we still have connection with him? I believe so. All right, let's go on and then try to make some contact. Um, Council Member Smith. Yes. Council Member Freeman. No. And Council Member Sullivan. Yes. Motion is approved with Council Member. Council, let's make sure Council Member Weir, that we don't have a technical difficulty. Three, three. I need Council Member Weir to chime in or the mayor will cast the tie vote. What, okay, what are we voting on? I, I can't barely hear you, so. Okay, go ahead and crap. go ahead and. The vote was on the cleanup ordinances to be consistent with the ordinance just passed. In what? No. No, did you get it? Yes, thank you, Council Member Weir. Hello? Uh, yes, Council Member Weir, we heard you. He might not be able to hear us now. Uh, okay, thanks. I can hear you. Okay. Very good, uh, Madam Clerk. Uh, I can hear you. Yes, very good. Madam Clerk, uh, please go ahead and read the results, or continue. Did we go all the way down? Yes, Mayor. Yes, we did, so go ahead. Motion is approved with Council Members Parlier, Weir, and Freeman voting no. Thank you, and that ends that section. Uh, let's take a five minute break before we finish. We have a we still have quite a few items to go. Divorce. Uh, we'd like divorce delivered. I know we're having way too much fun, but let's reconvene. Madam Clerk, next item, please. Under appointments, seven regular appointments to the Bakersfield Youth Commission exist due to current vacancies for wards one, three, four, five, six, seven, and mayor's appointment, and eight alternate appointments exist due to current vacancies for all wards and mayor's appointments. Thank you, Madam Clerk. These appointments are by ward, therefore no ballots are required. I'm gonna make the mayor's nomination, then I'm gonna call on council, and per the recommendation of our city attorney, we'll first just do the regular nominations and then we will take a vote and then we'll do alternates in case somebody wants to. So it's my pleasure to nominate Sam Baldovinos who was here earlier and led us in the pledge. Sam served as my alternate this past year and now as a senior, I'm pleased to nominate him. So now council member Weir, council member Weir, can you hear me? Yes, we can now. 
Okay. Just your like um, regular first. I'd like to nominate Braden Burrow. Okay, Braden Burrow, Council Member Smith. Thank you. I'd like to nominate Gina Yum. Thank you, Council Member Freeman. I'd like to nominate Isaac Morgan. Thank you. And Council Member Sullivan. Yes, Riley Dyson, a senior at Bakersfield High School. Very good. Thank yes. you. Vice Mayor will be coming back for the motion, if you would. Yeah, I approve my nominee and I'd like to make a motion. Thank you. Motion and Madam Clerk. Vice Mayor Parlier. Aye. Council Member Rivera. Aye. Council Member Gonzalez. Aye. Council Member Weir. Aye. Council Member Smith. Yes. Council Member Freeman. Yes. And Council Member Sullivan. Yes. Motion Thank is approved. Thank you. Congratulations to that group. And now for anyone who wishes to nominate an alternate, uh, we'll go down again by Ward. Uh, Council Member Weir. Thank you. I would like to nominate Elizabeth Kelly. Thank you. Council Member Smith. Thank you. I'd like to nominate Sanja Miser. Thank you. Council Member Freeman. Thank you. I'd like to nominate Aditya. Katario. Thank you. And Council Member Sullivan, I don't think you had two for uh, two applications. No, just the one young lady, okay. which I appreciate. All right. Uh, Vice Mayor, I'd like to do a motion. It's my pleasure to make a motion to approve these nominees. You have a motion. Madam Clerk. Vice Mayor Parlier. Aye. Council Member Rivera. Aye. Council Member <laughs> Gonzalez. Aye. Council Member Weir. Aye. Council Member Smith? Yes. Council Member Freeman? Yes. And Council Member Sullivan? Yes. Motion is approved. Thank you. Madam Clerk, next item, please. Under consent calendar, items 8A through 8V for approval. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Does any council member wish to recuse themselves from an item? Council Member Gonzalez. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Due to conflicts or perceived conflict, I, Council Member Gonzalez, will abstain from one or more consent calendar agenda items. My vote to approve the consent calendar will only apply to those items for which I have not abstained. I'm abstaining from the following consent agenda calendar agenda items. 8X. Do uh, oh, excuse me. The proposed action will result again in a perceived financial benefit. Thank you, Councilmember Gonzalez, Vice Mayor. City Councilmember, wish to remove a consent item for separate consideration. Seeing none, I make a motion that we approve consent calendar items 8A through 8A B is in Victor, with the noted corrections or blue memo corrections by the City Clerk. Thank you. Madam City Clerk. A quick correction, Mayor. Items 8A through 8AV for approval. A staff memorandum has been provided for item 8Y, transmitting the lease agreement for this item. Thank you. And now we have a motion. Would you please call for the vote? Vice Mayor Parlier. Aye. Council Member Rivera. Aye. Council Member Gonzalez. Aye. Council Member Weir? Aye. Council Member Smith? Yes. Council Member Freeman? Yes. Council Member Sullivan? Aye. Motion is approved. Thank you. Next item, please. Under consent calendar public hearings, or I'm, my apologies, under hearings, public hearing regarding converting light fixtures at various city parks and facilities. Thank you. Our next item is the public hearing. Each side will be allowed 15 minutes. That's 15 minutes for all speakers per side. So it's important that you identify yourself and quickly move on. 
We'll hear statements from those first opposed to staff's recommendation, then we'll hear from those who would like to speak in favor of staff's recommendation. If there's testimony on both sides, each side will be allowed a five-minute rebuttal. There's a clock on the TV screens behind me, which indicates 15 minutes. Please step to the mic and identify yourself. After 14 minutes, a light will come on, and at the end of 15 minutes, a red light will flash, indicating your time is up. You may ask questions during your statement, but they will be addressed once the public hearing is closed. If you have written comments that are longer than your verbal statement, please give those to the clerk. She'll provide copies to the council. Please be courteous to all who wish to speak. Unless there's approval by the majority of the council, there's a strict 15-minute limit, so please be concise and avoid repeating yourself. Madam Clerk, please read the public, stating, public hearing item. Public hearing item one, a resolution to dispense with formal bidding procedures. And two, enter into an energy service contract with Advanced Lighting Services Incorporated to provide turnkey services, not to exceed $802,600. Thank you. Mr. Clegg. Honorable Mayor and Council, uh, Public Works Director Nick Fiddler will speak to this item. Thank you. Mr. Fiddler. Honorable Mayor, City Council members, uh, staff is proposing to convert over 2,000 uh, decorative lights or lights within 14 parks and two parking structures uh, to improve the electrical costs and to improve the safety of those facilities. Um, as you may recall, the city replaced approximately 13,000 street lights in 2018 utilizing a PG&E's on-bill financing program. This project proposes to utilize the same PG&E on-bill financing program where the city will receive a 0% interest loan from PG&E to replace the, the uh, fixtures and the uh, loan will be repaid through uh, savings cost and, um, of each fixture. Staff has been working with PG&E for over a year on this program and advanced lighting to review each of the parks to determine whether or not this project is feasible. We are now at the point where we can uh, move forward with this program because pg &E has approved the process. Staff, uh, has, staff has identified that this project will result in over $100,000 savings annually once the loan has been repaid and staff is also recommending that we, that we use government code 4217.10 to uh, enter into an er energy service contract without going through formal bidding process. Staff recommends approval of the resolution and agreement. Thank you, Mr. Fiddler. At this time, I'll open the public hearing. Is there anyone who wishes to speak in opposition to staff's recommendation? Seeing none, is there anyone who wishes to speak in support of staff's recommendation? Seeing none, I will close the public hearing, return it to Council for comment and action. Vice Mayor. Make a motion that we approve resolution and agreement. Thank you. We have a motion, Madam Clerk. Vice Mayor Parlier. Aye. Council Member Rivera. Aye. Council Member Gonzalez. Aye. Council Member Weir. Aye. Council Member Smith. Yes. Council Member Freeman. Aye. And Council Member Sullivan. Aye. Motion is unanimously <coughs> approved. Thank you. Madam Clerk, next item, please. We have Council and Mayor statements. Thank you. Colleagues, I don't see any requests to speak at this point. Is there anyone who is trying to? We have spoken a lot. Oh, Council Member Sullivan would like to speak. I'll make it brief. I'll make it brief. Uh, yes, I want to congratulate. There, there's, there's a very special award that is given every year by the Better Business Bureau to, a, uh, to one of our local businesses. And Dream Maker Bath and Kitchen won the award this year. Um, uh, Everett and, and Patty Gray, um, a great couple. You're going to, hopefully, you'll be meeting Patty. Uh, she is campaigning to take my place. She's great. She's wonderful. And uh, so congratulations to uh, Everett and Patty Gray, uh, Dream Maker Bath and Kitchen. That is an amazing award, the Ethics Award. I mean, they really, they, they're a great, great couple, great business. So congratulations. 
Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Councilmember Sullivan. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. I recently had an opportunity, <clears throat> excuse me, to look at our City Council Policy and Procedures Manual, and I was surprised to see that it comprised of nine chapters and five full binders. So I don't believe that the policy has been reviewed by the Council in some time, and I think it makes sense for us to start that review, at least Chapter 5 of the manual, which deals with Council proceedings, so we can start 2021 off with our new Council on the same page with those guidelines fresh in our minds. So I'd make a referral to the City Attorney to come back to us, October meeting, uh, to present that chapter uh, to the Council in a workshop setting and uh, with some suggestions or modifications that are necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Anyone else wishing to speak? Well, seeing none, we have the pleasure of adjourning our meeting at 826.